Okay, so welcome everyone to the 59th lecture of Dr. Hyderi Step 1. Uh, before we, we begin, can we ask that if you guys can hear my voice, if you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes please on the chat box? Can I please get a yes on the chat box? Okay, good, very good. Yeah, okay, so happy new year. Um, thank you for making it to the lecture. I know that most of you are not willing, uh, we're not willing to do the classes today for the fact that it's, it's the 1st of Jan, 2021. And um, thank you so much for letting me start my new year and this beautiful way of teaching you guys um, the first date of USMLE step one. And uh, let me begin today's lecture by giving you guys uh, my blessing of uh, doing extremely well in your USMLE step one. And hope you guys have a very good year a safe year, um, hope your family stays safe. And uh, I hope that by after the end of this year, by next time, this uh, by January, by the 1st of January, 2022, you guys will be preparing for your USMLE step two and should be done by USMLE step one. Okay, so having said that, how did you guys enjoy your uh, New Year's Eve? Did you guys have a good time? Did you guys have a good time on your New Year's Eve? Okay, good. Okay. So while we wait for all the other students to join, today we we said that we were going to focus by starting our lecture with glycogen storage diseases and uh, lysosomal storage diseases. Okay. But before we do that, can we do a quick uh, revision and recapitulation of yesterday's lecture? Because we studied a lot of high yield pathways. Yes or no, are you guys ready to do a revision and recapitulation of yesterday's lecture? Okay, good. So let's begin with the revision and recapitulation of yesterday's lecture. What we're going to do is we're going to share our screen over here. Okay. One second. Okay, there you guys are. Okay, if you guys can see my screen, can I get a Yes, on the chat box. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Okay, so let's begin with the, the revision and recapitulation of yesterday's lecture. Uh, the, we're, we're, we are just going to discuss the pathways in a very detailed manner. So if you guys can just help me finish the pathways, I'd really appreciate it. For example, we're gonna start with a glycolytic pathway right now, initially, if I start with glucose, can you guys tell me what's the next step of glucose over here? What's the next step of glucose break breakdown? Glucose 6-phosphate, okay. Then what happens after this? Fructose 6-phosphate, very good. What happens after this? Fructose 6-phosphate, then fructose 1,6-phosphate. Okay, then after this, you have Glyceraldehyde, 3-phosphate, and dihydroxyacetophosphate. And then, then, then what happens? This gets broken down to 
one three best fossil glycerate right and so far and so forth okay one three base phosphoglycerate okay then three phosphoglycerate two phosphoglycerate phosphoenol pyruvate then we have pyruvate right then we have acetyl coa okay good did you guys get a chance to go through the pathway yesterday yes or no Okay, good. And uh, did you guys get the biochemistry map from the email which we sent you? Okay. Okay, good, very good. So, um, do you guys want to begin with the, with the glycogen storage diseases and the lysosome, uh, lysosomal diseases right now, or do you want to uh, do it at the end? Begin now. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to begin with the lysozyme, with the lysosomal storage diseases. Lysosomal storage diseases, have you guys studied the lysosomal storage diseases before? Yes or no? Lysosomal storage diseases, have you guys studied the lysosomal storage diseases before? So basically, okay, so let's, so, okay. Let's talk about the lysosomal storage diseases over here for one second before we jump into the uh, lecture to see what happens, okay? So basically lysosomal, lysosomal storage diseases are the one of the uh, most high yield um, diseases which we will study in biochemistry, okay? So uh, we, we are going to begin with our uh, first aid read through from now it's 916 as of right now and we are going to begin because yesterday we said that we are going to begin with lysosomal storage diseases and glycogen storage diseases and that's what we're going to do okay so without any further ado let's begin with lysosomal storage diseases lysosomal storage diseases is everyone ready is everyone ready to talk about lysosomal storage diseases Okay, good. So basically, lysosomal storage diseases is, are diseases that are caused by deficiency of lysosomal enzymes. They're caused by deficiencies of lysosomal enzymes. Okay, okay. So what are the lysosomal storage diseases and what are the lysosomal storage enzymes. So first of all, the first, we will talk about a short pathway over here. Okay, we will talk about a short pathway over here. In lysozyme, there's a certain type of uh, pathway that keeps on happening. Okay, there's a, there's a certain type of a pathway that keeps on happening. First of all, you have this product called GM2. GM2. GM2, okay, GM2 gets broken down to GM3 in the lysozyme. GM2 gets broken down to GM3. The enzyme over here, the en enzyme is hexose amanidase. The enzyme is hexose amanidase. Okay, hexose amanidase. Next one. Next one, GM3 is broken down to form glucocerebroside, glucocerebroside. And over here, you have another one that's called ceramide, that's called 
ceramide trihexoside. Ceramide trihexoside. Ceramide trihexoside also forms glucocerebroside by the help of another enzyme. The name of the enzyme is alpha galacto. Name of the enzyme is alpha gal galactoside. Alpha galactositis A. Okay, the name of the enzyme is alpha galactositis A. We are just going to talk about the pathways. The pathways are not important or high yield for step one, but but the pathways are mentioned in the U world, and you will not receive questions from the pathway. You will receive questions from the clinical scenario. We're just going to talk about the pathways for one second because uh, that's how we would know which enzymes are deficient and what's happening over here. Glucocerebroside is, is converted to ceramide. Ceramide. Okay. And the enzyme that is responsible for this one is glucocerebrosidase. Glucocerebrosidase. Okay, that's that. A another one, ceramide. Ceramide over here is the last byproduct and the final product of the lysosomal synthesis. Next one, there's another one over here that's called galactocerebroside. Galactocerebroside. And another one that's over here that's called sphingomyelin. Sphingomyelin. Sphingomyelin is converted to, to ceramide and galactocerebroside. They're also converted to ceramide. And another one over here that's called sulfatides and sulfatides are converted to galactocerebroside. You have one, two, three more enzymes. This enzyme that works over here, this enzyme is known as aryl sulfatase. Aryl sulfatase. This enzyme that works over here, this enzyme is called galactocerebroside. And this enzyme that works over here, that's called sphingomyelinase. Okay. Now, what is the reason that we are drawing this pathway, although this pathway is not important for the USMD step one? The reason why I drew this pathway in a very rough manner is because I want to make sure that you guys understand that these enzymes are the ones that if they are deficient, if they are deficient, they will result in the accumulation of these substances, of these previous substances. And these previous substances, when they accumulate in the lysozyme, they cause the lysosomal storage diseases. For example, over here, sulfatides are converted to galactocerebroside by, by aryl sulfatase. If this enzyme is deficient, this will result in the accumulation of sulfatides in the lysozyme. And this accumulation of the lysozyme of sulfatides will result in the lysosomal storage diseases. So that's that. Are we clear about this? The small basic information? Yes or no? Are we clear about the small basic information? Can I get a yes in the chat box? Okay. Okay, good. So without further ado, let's begin with uh, the lecture. So we're going to be we're going to start talking about the lysosomal storage diseases over here. Okay. What is the enzyme for the conversion of sulfatides? The enzyme is aryl sulfatides. Aryl sulfatides. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start with the lysosomal storage storage diseases. Each is caused by a deficiency in one of the many lysosomal enzymes. This results in accumulation of an abnormal metabolic products. In lysosomal storage diseases, you have sphingolipidosis and you, you have mucopolysaccharidosis. Okay, sphingolipidosis and mucopolysaccharidosis. So the first disease that we're going to talk about is Tay-Sachs disease. Okay, so let's begin. Are, are we ready to begin with uh, the physio videos? Yes or no? 
because for this one, in order to remember everything, we are going to begin with the physio videos. And then we're going to come back to the table to see if we remember everything about the lysosomal storage diseases. Okay. Can we have a single student who can volunteer to uh, take the pictures of the lysosomal storage diseases? We know that Dr. Jordan was uh, responsible for doing it. And thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. But we want to give, uh, we want to make sure it's not a burden on Dr. Jordan. So if anyone else is, okay, Dr. Garbasi, thank you. So would you be kind enough to take the pictures of the lysosomal storage diseases and please upload them in your spare time? Okay. Okay. Okay, so the first two diseases that we're gonna talk about is Tay-Sachs and Neiman pig disease. And we are going to use the picture mnemonic that is provided over here in physio. And we are going to begin right now. Welcome to section 19.1 of metabolism in this. Okay. <clears throat> is everyone ready? Do I have everyone's attention? Is everyone ready? Do I have everyone's attention? Oh, okay, good. So let's begin. Uh, this picture mnemonic will show us everything that we need to know about lysosomal storage diseases, that is Tay-Sachs and Neiman pig disease at the same time. Okay, please put your attention to the video. And then after this, we'll talk about this in a separate page. So without further ado, let's get started. Dr. Karwasi, are you ready? Okay, good. So let's begin. This video will focus on memorizing the details of Tay-Sachs and Neiman pig disease. Let's get started. This scene will take place at the home of an ordinary man who has a nice big cherry tree on the side of his yard. Notice that there are a bunch of sacks around the tree that are filled with cherries. The sacks full of cherries are here to help you remember Tay-Sachs disease. So sack full of cherries for Tay-Sachs disease. This guy heard some ruckus, so he came running outside with his gun. He's not very happy either because he was in the middle of something important. Let's zoom up so we can see what he was up to before he got interrupted. Oh, gross. He was picking his nose. That's kind of awkward. But the good news is that this should help you remember Neiman pick disease. So picking his nose for Neiman pick disease. If we zoom back out, you can see that now we've added a giant lizard on this man's cherry tree. This is to help you remember that Tay Sachs and Neiman pick disease are both lysosomal storage diseases. Lizard sounds kind of like lysosome, so we'll be using lizards in each of the lysosomal storage diseases to represent this idea. So lizard for lysosomal storage disease. If we go back to this view, we can see that this man is clearly using his finger to pick his nose. This is to remind you of the mnemonic, no man picks his nose with his finger. Finger sounds like sphinger and is here to help you remember that the deficient enzyme in Neiman pick disease is sphingomyelinase. So sphinger for sphingomyelinase. It will also help you remember that sphingomyelin is the accumulated substrate. Both sphingomyelinase and sphingomyelin sound so similar that we thought it would be best to just have one symbol for both of these ideas. So again, sphinger for sphingomyelin is the accumulated substrate. Okay, notice that we've shown a cane next to the old man with the gun. He's old and needs a bit of help getting around, but once he got to the door, he dropped the cane and pulled out his gun. The cane represents weakness because most people using canes probably have some sort of weakness that prevents them from not needing a cane. The cane refers to the idea that Neiman pick disease results in neurodegeneration, which is clinically manifested as weakness. The reason the man came outside in the first place was because of his loyal dog. Notice this Dalmatian howling and barking. If you look closely, you can also see that the dog has a little spot on its trunk that looks like a liver. The liver spot here should help you remember that Neiman pick disease results in hepatosplenomegaly. If we zoom up, we can also see that the dog is even foaming at the mouth. He must be really upset. The foam here is to help you remember that foam cells or lipid-laden macrophages can be seen on pathology in Neiman pick disease. So dog foaming at the mouth for foam cells. Okay, before we move on to Tay-Sachs disease, I'd like to draw your attention to one more point. The spotlights on the house were turned on very brightly as the old man opened the door. Notice how the lights are shining on the cherry tree. This part of the image is to help you remember that a cherry red spot on the macula can be seen in both Neiman pick disease and Tay-Sachs disease. So lights on cherry tree for cherry red spot. Okay, now let's discuss Tay-Sachs disease. For the most part, 
All of the information on the right side of the image will represent Tay-Sachs disease. Notice this hexagon-shaped stop sign that got knocked over? This is here to help you remember that the deficient enzyme in Tay-Sachs disease is hexosaminidase A. The fact that the sign got knocked over should help you remember that this is the deficient enzyme. So hexagon-shaped stop sign for hexosaminidase A is the deficient enzyme. The reason the sign got knocked over, the dog started barking, and this old man came out in the first place was because these punk kids were stealing cherries from the beloved cherry tree. These kids are in a gang, and they like to go around stealing all of the cherries from the neighborhoods. The gang of kids here should help you remember that the accumulated substrate in Tay-Sachs disease is GM2 gangliocide. The fact that there are several gang members should help you remember that this is the accumulated substrate. So gang for GM2 gangliocide. This poor gang member was even shot in the leg. That old man must be pretty crazy to shoot a kid in the leg just for stealing cherries. This part of the image should help you remember that, just like Neiman Pick disease, Tay-Sachs disease also results in progressive neurodegeneration, which is clinically manifested as weakness. Additionally, developmental delay, such as the inability to walk, may be a clinical manifestation of Tay-Sachs disease. So the guy shot in the leg here should help you remember these ideas. Finally, notice that this lizard's skin is starting to peel off, kind of like how the skin of an onion peels off when you're cutting up an onion. This part of the image is here to help you remember that lysosomes with onion skin may be seen in Tay-Sachs disease. The fact that the skin is coming off of the lizard should help you remember that this pathological finding is referring to the lysosomes. So skin peeling off the lizard for lysosomes with onion skin. And that should be everything you need to know about Tay-Sachs disease and neiman pick disease. Okay, so that is everything you more or less you do need to know about Tay-Sachs and um, Neiman pig disease. Okay, Dr. Garbasi, you took the picture. So let's talk about the Tay-Sachs and Neiman pig disease to see if you guys have learned everything or not. First and foremost, in Tay-Sachs disease, what is the deficient enzyme? Which enzyme is deficient? Fast answers, please. Hexosaminidase, very good. What is the deficient enzyme in Neiman pig disease? Sphingomyelinase, okay. Okay, so Tay-Sachs, deficient enzyme is hexosaminidase, accumulated substance is GM. What is the accumulated substance in the Tay-Sachs disease? What is the accumulated substance in Tay-Sachs disease? GM2, gangliocide, okay. And another one is neiman pig disease. The deficient enzyme, as you mentioned, was sphingomyelinase. What is the accumulated substance in the neiman pig disease? Accumulated substance in neiman pig disease? Sphingomyelin, very good. Single myelin. Okay. Can you guys tell me the clinical features of Tay Sachs disease? Clinical features of Tay Sachs disease. What are the clinical features? Neurodegeneration. Then what else? J red spot on the macula. Then what else? Onion skin of the lysosomes. Then hepatospinomegaly. Okay. Do you have foam cells over here? Do you have foam cells on Tay-Sachs? Very good. No, no foam cells. Next one is neiman pick disease. neiman pick disease. Yes, there is no hepatosplenomegaly on Tay-Sachs. No hepatosplenomegaly. Okay. neiman pick disease. Muscle weakness, then what else? Hepatosplenomegaly. Okay. Foam cells. Can you guys tell me what are foam cells? What are foam cells? Foam cells. Foam cells are basically lipid laden macrophages. Foam cells are lipid laden macrophages. Okay. We will we'll, we'll see. The... That's four foam cells. Can you guys just give me one minute, please?
Okay, can you guys hear my voice? Can, can you guys hear my voice? Okay, my apologies. I'm really sorry. I was just, just a call about my father. Um, uh, he's still in the hospital and everything. <clears throat> so, um, where were we? Okay, so we were talking about Neiman pig disease. Okay, so that's where we were. Yes, um, he is fine. He has been in the hospital for the last one month. So I really need you guys to pray for my father over here to make sure that he can come back home safe. Okay, thank you so much for your prayers for my family. And uh, let's get this started, okay. Tay-Sachs disease. So we talked about the clinical features of Tay-Sachs disease. First, so we talked about the fact how Tay-Sachs disease has pro progressive neurodegeneration, no hepatosplenomegaly, cherry red spot, and Neiman pig disease. We talked about um, hepatosplenomegaly, foam cells, and cherry red spots on the macula. Okay. And okay, so if I ask you a question that um, if you have cherry red spot on the, on the macula for both Neiman pig disease and Tay-Sachs disease, can we assume that if the patient has hepatosplenomegaly and the patient has foam cells, then these are the two differentiating points from Neiman pig disease and Tay-Sachs disease, yes or no? Yes or no? Okay. So in your question, if you receive a USMLE step one question, if you see cherry red spot, the first two things that I need you guys to think about is Neiman pig and Tay-Sachs disease. Neiman pig and Tay-Sachs disease. Then the next two things I want you to see is presence or absence of hepatosplenomegaly and foam cells. If there's hepatosplenomegaly and foam cells, it's Neiman pig disease. If there's absent, it's Tay-Sachs disease. Okay, if it's absent, it's Tay-Sachs. If it's present, it's this one. Let's see if we have covered everything from first aid over here. Okay. So Tay-Sachs disease is a progressive new neurodegeneration developmental delays over there, hyperreflexia is over there, and hyperacusis. These two things are also there, so don't forget this. Hyperreflexia and hyperacusis is also there. Cherry red spots in the macula, lysosomes with onion skin, and no hepatosplenomegaly. Versus Neiman pig disease, these are the lipid-laden macrophages, that is the foam cells. There's progressive new neurodegeneration, hepatosplenomegaly, there's foam cells over here, cherry red spot on the macula. Um, the enzyme is sphingomyelinase, and the accumulated substance is sphingomyelin. Okay, so that's that. Um, are we confident about Tay-Sachs and hyperacusis? Hyperacusis means, hyperacusis means that you, you will hear loud noises. You will hear loud noises. Do you guys remember we talked about hyperacusis in terms of um, facial nerve uh, injury, facial nerve injury? Do you remember facial nerve injury? We talked about hyperacusis, how the stapes is uh, more mobilized and extreme mobilization of the stapes results in hyperacusis. Okay, so that's that. If we receive questions about Tay-Sachs disease and Neiman pig disease, can we be confident that uh, we can answer them uh, fully? The questions will come from over here, okay? And the answers will either be the diagnosis, but the questions will come from over here. These are your questions. These, the findings are your questions. Your answers will either be the diagnosis or the enzyme, the name of the enzyme will be the diagnosis or the accumulated substance will be the diagnosis. After we are done with this one, we will do a couple of questions to make sure that we have understood everything. Okay, are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay, good. Are we ready to begin the next one that is Fabry disease? Okay. Dr. Karbasi, are you ready? Okay, let's Welcome go. to section 19.2 of metabolism. In this video, we'll focus on memorizing the details of Fabre disease. Let's get started. This scene takes place at a gas station with an old grandma sitting in a car and crocheting some fabric. Notice the fabric that goes up around the seat. Fabric sounds like Fabre, so the fabric in this scene is our symbol for Fabre disease. If you look closely what this grandma is crocheting, you can see that it looks kind of like sausage links. There's a large segment followed by a narrow segment, which is what we use to represent neurons. The sausage looking fabric in this scene is used to help you remember that one of the clinical features of Fabre disease is peripheral neuropathy. 
Just like we've done with other videos, a car usually represents something cardiac related. So in this scene, the car should help you remember that another clinical feature of Fabre disease is cardiovascular disease. Notice that the car has a bunch of interesting looking rust spots on it. In fact, the rusted spots actually resemble an angiokeratoma rash. This is a picture of an angiokeratoma rash. Notice all of the little hemorrhagic spots. So the rusted chip paint on the car should help you remember that another clinical feature of Fabre disease is an angiokeratoma rash. Next, notice that we've added this out of order sign and this guy here is pretty bummed because they need some gas. He has the hose feeding into the gas tank, but this is all in vain because no gas is coming out. This idea represents the kidneys. The kidneys produce urine and are connected to the bladder and urethra through ureters, just like the gas station produces gasoline, which then exits the pump through specialized tubing. So in this image, the fact that the gas station is out of order should help you remember that a clinical feature of Fabre disease is progressive renal failure. Many gas stations have some sort of sign that displays the gas prices or temperature outside. So we've included one of these signs showing that the temperature is 120 degrees. Oh, that's pretty hot. That grandma must be pretty crazy to sit in the car without any air conditioning. However, if you look closely at our two characters, you can see that neither of them are sweating. Seems pretty odd considering how hot it is. The temperature sign and lack of sweat should help you remember that another clinical feature of Fabre disease is hypohydrosis. Not only is the car rusted and out of gas, it's also having tire problems. The guy sitting on the ground got out the lug nut remover and opened up the trunk, but then he realized he didn't have a wheel to change the tire. Now he's sitting on the side wondering what to do. Notice that the lug nut remover is shaped like an X. This is to help you remember that Fabre disease is an X-linked recessive disorder. So X-shaped lug nut remover for X-linked recessive. In most of the lysosomal storage disease videos, we won't have a symbol for the inheritance because most of them are autosomal recessive. I mentioned this in our genetics videos, but I'll mention it again here. If you've memorized all of the autosomal dominant and X-linked recessive disorders from our two genetics images, then you can deduce that any other genetic disease you see on step one must be autosomal recessive. So keep this in mind as we cover different diseases with the type of inheritance. If it's not in the picture, then it's most likely autosomal recessive. However, as we've shown in this image, the X-shaped lug nut remover should help you remember that Fabre disease is unique among the lysosomal storage diseases because it's an X-linked recessive disorder. Just like in other lysosomal storage disease videos, we've shown this lizard in the background to help you remember that this is a lysosomal storage disease. This shouldn't be too surprising considering the setting of this image. It's very hot outside and the scene appears to take place in a desert setting, which is where lizards tend to live. So lizard for lysosomal storage disease. Unfortunately for the grandma and the guy sitting on the ground, this stinking lizard knocked over the last gallon of gas. The guy is handling it pretty poorly as you can tell by him sitting on the ground in frustration. But for some reason, the grandma doesn't seem to care too much. Maybe it's because she has something to keep her occupied as they wait for someone to rescue them. Anyways, the gallon of gas spilled on the sidewalk is here to help you remember that the deficient enzyme in Fabre disease is alpha-galactosidase A. Gallon sounds like galacto and sidewalk sounds like cytase. So these two ideas should help you remember alpha-galactosidase A. Finally, notice that we've added these ceramic vases in the trunk. The poor guy was hoping for some gasoline or a spare tire in the trunk, but neither were to be found. The grandma had taken out all of these useless items just before their trip and loaded the trunk up with her vases. Ceramic sounds like ceramide, so the ceramic vases represent ceramide trihexoside. The fact that there are a bunch of them which have accumulated in the trunk should help you remember that the accumulated substrate in Fabre disease is ceramide trihexoside. And there you have it. Everything you need to know about Fabre disease. Okay. Dr. Grabasi, were you able to, to take a picture of the Fabre disease? Okay, good. Okay. How they connected the enzyme. The enzyme is alpha galactosidase for this gallon over here. For this gallon. Okay, once again, let's go back to see that this one. Galacto and sidewalk sounds like cytase. So these two ideas should help the deficient animal to rescue them. They seem to care too much. Pretty poorly, as you can tell by the grandma and the guy sitting on the ground, this stinking lizard knocked over the last gallon of gas. The guy is handling it pretty poorly, as you can tell by him sitting on the ground in frustration. But for some reason, the grandma doesn't seem to care too much. Maybe it's because she has something to keep her occupied as they wait for someone to rescue them. Anyways, the gallon of gas spilled on the sidewalk is here to help you remember that the deficient enzyme in Fabre disease is alpha-galactosidase A. Gallon sounds like galacto 
and sidewalk sounds like cytase. So these two ideas should help you remember alpha galactosidase A. Okay, are we clear now? Okay. Uh, trying to learn the lysosomal storage diseases from um, looking at the picture mnemonics from physio. Is it helping you guys or not helping you guys? Yes or no? Is this helpful or not helpful? Okay, so the reason why we are why we are doing this, okay, I do not want you guys to think that um, this is a shortcut to this is this is some sort of a shortcut to our lectures or something like this. The reason why we are doing this is because at the end of the day, when you try to think about lysosomal storage diseases, if you read the table ten times, there's a high possibility you will forget that alpha galactosidase is, for example, alpha galactosidase is the enzyme for, for Febri disease. But the next time you think about Febri disease, you will think about the word fabric. And when you think about fabric, you'll think about Febri disease, Febri disease with the grandma over here. And if they ask you, which is the deficient enzyme, when you think about this picture, you will remember that there's a gallon which fell down over here and that's the this gallon is known as alpha galactosidase this is this will help you and this types of ceramide over here this accumulation substrate is ceramide trihexoside so the, the ceramide vases or vas will help you remember that the accumulated substance or substrate is ceramide trihexoside okay in in this way you will realize that it will be very easy for you to remember all this information over here in your actual exam are we clear about this Accumulation enzyme, please. Enzyme, okay. Is should help you remember alpha galactosidase A. Finally, notice that we've added these ceramic vases in the trunk. The poor guy was hoping for some gasoline or a spare tire in the trunk, but neither were to be found. The grandma had taken out all of these useless items just before their trip and loaded the trunk up with her vases. So okay, Dr. Dahlia, are you clear about this? The accumulated Substrate is the, cer the ceramic vases will help you remember that it's ceramide trihexoside. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay, good. Okay, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about Febri disease, Febri disease. What is the, the deficient enzyme over here in, in Febri disease? Fast answers, please. What is the deficient enzyme in Febri disease? What is the deficient enzyme in Febri disease, please? Fast answers, alpha galactoside, alpha galactoside, okay. What is the accumulated substance? What is the accumulated substance? Ceramide trihexoside, ceramide trihexoside, okay, good. Now, uh, what are the clinical findings of Febri disease? What are the clinical findings of the Febri disease? What do we find over here? Peripheral neuropathy, angiokeratosis, right? Angiokeratoma, angiokeratoma, renal failure. This is renal failure and cardiovascular diseases. So this is the only, um, this is um, the fact that there's renal failure in Febri disease this is extremely high yield, renal failure. For Febri disease, renal and renal failure and cardiovascular diseases in the late stages is extremely, extremely important. Another one is hypohydrosis. Do you guys remember hypohydrosis? Do you, do you know what hypohydrosis is? Hypohydrosis is decreased sweating. Decreased sweating. The patients will not sweat. Hypohydrosis. Okay. Okay, Febri disease, it's a triad of peripheral neuropathy, angiokeratoma, and hypohydrosis. So you have peripheral neuropathy, hypohydrosis, and angiokeratoma. That's the early stage. In the late stage, you have renal failure and cardiovascular diseases. Okay. Then the accumulated substance is ceramide trihexoside. This is also known as globo, -tria, globo triosyl 
ceramide, global trial style ceramide. This is not high yield. The most commonly mentioned one is ceramide trihexoside. That's that. Alpha galactoside is A, is the accumulated, is the, the deficient and is the deficient enzyme. Your questions once again will come from over here. And the answers will either be the diagnosis or the answers will be the deficient enzyme and accumulated substance. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Okay, good. After we are done with this, we will do a small test uh, quiz. Okay, we will do a small quiz. So please make sure that you guys put out your attention. Okay, are we ready for the next one? Okay, are we understanding these diseases? Okay, you have a patient with cherry red spot in the macula, the patient has neurodegeneration and the patient has lysosomes with onion skin appearance. What is your diagnosis? Fast answers. You have a patient with cherry red spot, hepatosplenomegaly foam cells. What is the accumulated substance? What is the accumulated substance, not the diagnosis? Okay. You have a patient with peripheral neuropathy, angiokeratomas, hypohydrosis. What is the accumulated substance? Accumulated substance. Okay, good. Are we ready for the next one? Okay. Welcome to section. Okay, Dr. Krabasti, are you ready? Okay, good. 19.3 of metabolism. In this video, we'll focus on memorizing the details of metachromatic leukodystrophy. Let's get started. This scene will take... So we are going to discuss with metachromatic leukodystrophy, okay? Details of metachromatic leukodystrophy. Let's get started. This scene will take place under the sea with a famous mermaid known as Ariella. She wishes she could be a human, so she likes to collect chrome-looking trophies that remind her of the human world. Notice the chrome plate and cup trophies in the background. This is to help remind you of metachromatic leukodystrophy. So chrome trophy for metachromatic leukodystrophy. Do you notice another chrome looking trophy? That's right, this lizard looking trophy is also chrome colored. Just like in other lysosomal storage diseases, we've included a lizard in this picture to help you remember that metachromatic leukodystrophy is a lysosomal storage disease. So lizard for lysosomal storage disease. Okay, now let's turn our attention to Ariella. Unfortunately for her, she wanted to become a human so much that she made a deal with Ursella, a wicked octopus sea witch who has tricked her and is now casting a spell on Ariella. Notice that Ariella appears to be stuck as a result of the spell. She's on the ocean floor and can't move kind of like she's inhibited or deficient. In this image, Ariella represents aryl sulfatase A. The fact that she appears to be stuck by this magic spell should help you remember that in metachromatic leukodystrophy, aryl sulfatase A is the deficient enzyme. So Ariella is stuck for aryl sulfatase A deficiency. The spell is also preventing her from moving. Notice that her flipper is stuck to the ocean floor and that she appears upset because she can't move. This should help you remember that one of the clinical features of this disorder is ataxia. So flippers stuck to the ocean floor for ataxia. Okay, now let's take a closer look at Ursella. Notice anything unique about her tentacles? That's right, they look kind of like nerves. There's a large segment followed by a short segment. The large segments seen on Ursella's tentacles are kind of like the thick areas of the nerve where there is a prominent myelin sheath surrounding the axon. More specifically, the big thick tentacles extending away from her body represent the peripheral nerves. So tentacles for peripheral nerves. Also notice how her black tentacles appear to merge as they wrap around her abdomen and the more central part of her body. This is a reference to the central nervous system. So black tentacle looking dress for central nervous system. These parts of the scene should help you remember that metachromatic leukodystrophy results in central and peripheral demyelination. Okay, let's add another character to the scene. This little bug looking creature is Ariella's father, but Ursella turned him into this poor, unfortunate soul. Notice that he looks a bit confused and has stars spinning around his head. This is used to represent dementia, which is one of the clinical features of metachromatic leukodystrophy. 
So stars spinning around his head for dementia. Okay, it's about time we added the hero to the scene. This human character is named Merrick, and he's deeply in love with Ariella, which is why he has come to the rescue. Notice that he's using the spear to stab Ursella in the side as he tries to stop her in her cruelty. The spear in her side represents that the accumulated substrate is cerebricide sulfate. So spear in the side for cerebricide sulfate. I wonder how this dramatic scene will end. I wish there was a movie I could watch to find out. Okay. <clears throat> does, does anyone have a young daughter or a, or like uh, anyone who's a fan of Little Mermaid? Does anyone have? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So if you were watching it with your daughter right now, then they would have had a good time too. So this is the story about Little Mermaid, about Eras sulfatase enzyme deficiency with the disease known as metachromatic leukodystrophy. So let's talk about metachromatic leukodystrophy over here. First of all, did you guys understand all the informations in the um, picture? Yes or no? Okay, good. So let's talk about metachromatic leukodystrophy. Metachromatic leukodystrophy. Okay, so what uh, what is the deficient enzyme in metachromatic leuco leukodystrophy? What is the deficient enzyme? Fast answers, please. Aryl sulfatase, very good. Aryl sulfatase for Ariella, the little mermaid. Okay, what is the accumulated substance in metachromatic leukodystrophy? What is the accumulated substance in metachromatic leukodystrophy? Cerebroside. Okay, good. What are the clinical features? <coughs> Excuse me, my apologies. <clears throat> the clinical features. The clinical features are central and peripheral demyelination, ataxia, dementia. Okay, the most common one is ataxia, dementia, dementia. Okay. Okay, let's see if we have covered everything over here from first aid. Metachromatic leukodystrophy is central and peripheral demyelination, ataxia and dementia. Aryl sulfatase A is the enzyme deficiency and cerebrosulfate. Cerebroside sulfate is the accumulated substance. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay, good. Can we move on to the next disease? Okay. Welcome to section 19. Okay. Uh, Dr. Carbasi, are you ready? Okay, so let's get this. 1.4 of metabolism. In this video, we'll focus on memorizing the details of crab disease. Let's get started. This is a scene of an eating contest. On the left side of the image, notice this man doing his best to eat as much crab as he can manage. All of the crab on the image should help you remember that this is crab disease. Did you notice anything unique about the center plate? That's right, there's a lizard decoration. Just like in other lysosomal storage disease videos, the lizard here is to help you remember that crab disease is a lysosomal storage disease. So lizard for lysosomal storage disease. In an eating contest, there has to be an opponent or it wouldn't be a contest, right? So on the right side of the image, we've included this guy here snarfing down a bunch of sausage links. The sausage links look kind of like neurons and the fact that they're being eaten alludes to the idea of neuronal destruction. So this part of the image is here to help you remember that Crab disease results in oligodendrocyte destruction. Sausage links being eaten, oligodendrocyte destruction. This contender came dressed in his lucky red boots. He has also been getting a bit carried away with the contest, as you can probably tell based on the sausage blood stains all over his hands. The red boots and red hands allude to peripheral neuropathy. One of the clinical features of crab disease is peripheral neuropathy. So red boots and red hands for peripheral neuropathy. It's always a good idea to have some water with your meal, but in this contest, 
No water is allowed until after the meals are finished. Sounds pretty awful, right? These guys are hardcore. Anyways, the gallons of water on the side table here will be our symbol for galactocerebrosides and galactocerebroside. Gallon sounds kind of like galacto, and the side table should help you remember cides and side. So gallons on the side table for galactocerebrosides and galactocerebroside. Because these sound so similar, we thought it would be best to just have one symbol for them. Galactocerebrosides is the deficient enzyme, and galactocerebroside is the accumulated substrate. Okay, moving on. This guy here is the one who organized the event, and he's holding up the trophy as he tries to encourage the contestants. If you look at his huge smile, you can see that he appears to be kind of psycho-looking. His psycho-looking smile should help you remember that psychocene is also an accumulated substrate. Also, look closely at his eyes and glasses in relation to his humongous smile. They're pretty small, right? This is to help you remember that crab disease results in optic atrophy. So, small eyes and small glasses for optic atrophy. At any good eating contest, there is a crowd of people cheering on the contestants, so we've shown these supportive characters by the table. As this guy in the blue shirt began cheering excitedly, he accidentally knocked over one of the small plants. Notice that the plants get progressively bigger, going from left to right. I guess you could say that the plants are developing. The fact that this smaller plant right here got knocked over should help you remember that crab disease results in developmental delay. Okay, one final point. This chandelier has been added to the image to help the contestants see clearly while they devour crab and sausage. Notice that it's shaped like a globe of the world. This is to help you remember that globoid cells are seen on nerve biopsies in crab disease. This is a histological image of globoid cells. The globoid cells are right here. And there you have it, everything you need to know about crab disease. Okay, Dr. Garbasi, please take a picture. <clears throat> Let me know when you're done. Are you done? Okay, good. Okay, so did you understand crab. everything about crab disease? Did you guys understand everything about crab disease? Okay, good. So let's talk about crabs, crabs disease. Okay, crabs disease. First of all, what is the deficient enzyme for for crabs disease? What is the deficient enzyme for crabs disease? Fast answers, please. Galactocerebroside. Yes, it looks the same. It looks like the same in Fabry disease, but in Fabry disease, you have alpha galact alpha galactosidis. Over here, you have galactocerebroside. 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 Okay, next one is what is the accumulated substance? What is the accumulated substance? Accumulated substance. Which which substance is accumulated? Cycosine. Very good. <clears throat> Cycosine. How do you remember cycosine? Cycosine is from the psycho looking character in the picture, right? Psychosine. And also you have galactocerebroside. You have galactocerebroside. Okay, that's that. Okay, what are the uh, clinical findings of Crabs disease? What are the clinical findings of Crabs disease? Peripheral neuropathy. Then optic, uh, optic atrophy. Then what else? Developmental delay. And what type of cells will you find over here? What type of cells will you find over here? Globoid cells. These are the globoid cells, okay? Okay, what is the role of ceramide in Crab disease. There is no specific role of ceramide in Crab disease. Why do you ask that question? Ceramide. Hello, sir. Um, yeah. When we see the the flow chart uh, from GM two to GM three, mm -hmm. and then it change into the glucose cerebrosides to ceramide, mm -hmm. and then it's a uh, galactocerebrosides. <laughs> Okay, so we have talked about this one. Okay, so what's happening over here is you have galactocerebroside, 
And um, in Krebs disease, you have the, the galactosidebroside is converted to ceramide by the enzyme galactosidebrosidase. So the ceramide is basically the final product. You understand what I mean? This, the ceramide is the final product. That's that's the connection, nothing else. It's, if it's, not, it's yes. not the two-way two -way relation? Like no, no, no. It's not might make the galactosidebrosides. No, cerebral. it's not a two-way relation. It's a single pathway. Okay. In galactosidebrosides, you will have formation of the ceramide. And if uh, galactosidebrosidase is not there, then ceramide will decrease. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. My apologies. I think I have. I think I have a fever or something. <clears throat> okay. So that's that. Um, my apologies for coughing during the lectures. Trying my best not to cough. Okay. So that's that. Okay. So metachromatic leukodystrophy. Um, sorry, we were talking about the Krebs disease. So Krebs disease is there. Okay. Let's see if we if we have um, let's see if we have covered everything from Krebs disease, peripheral neuropathy. Then we have destructions of oligodendrocytes, which can result in developmental delay, optic atrophy, and globoid cells over here. Okay, and we also talked about the galactosidebrosidase, which is deficient, and the accumulated substances galactosidebroside. Also, cyclosine is also there, but that's that. Okay. So we are very close to the last one, more or less, of single lipidosis. <clears throat> that is Gaucher's disease, Gaucher's disease. Are we ready to begin? Because this is very important. Are we ready to begin Gaucher's disease? Okay, good. Dr. Kravasi, are you ready? Okay, good. Welcome to... Did you guys have fireworks in your in your in your country due to the New Year's? Oh, good, great. <laughs> okay. okay, we didn't have any. That's why. Okay, so we had no fireworks over here. Okay, no problem. So let's get this started. The last one that we're going to start is Gaucher's disease from sphingolipidosis. Please put your attention to the um, picture mnemonic. This is very important. So let's do this. Section 19.5 of Metabolism. In this video, we'll focus on memorizing the details of Gaucher disease. Let's get started. This scene will take place on the beach as this girl is trying to get her tan on. Hopefully, she'll speak with a dermatologist about this risky behavior, but for now, she is enjoying the moment and smearing this shea butter all over her body. Shea butter sounds kind of like Gaucher, so in this image, it will be our symbol for Gaucher disease. Shea butter, Gaucher disease. She came here in the first place to enjoy a birthday party, as you can probably tell from the happy birthday sign, along with the partially inflated balloons all over the place. In many of our images, we've been using red balloons to represent red blood cells. So in this image, we've shown balloons with multiple colors to represent all of the different types of blood cells. Additionally, the balloons are only partially inflated, which suggests a lack of blood cells. So putting these two ideas together, we get pancytopenia. Pancytopenia is a finding of Gaucher disease. So again, partially inflated balloons with various colors for pancytopenia. She also has brought a box of tissues with her to help smear the shea butter on her body. The box of tissues here is to help you remember that lipid-laden macrophages that resemble crumpled tissue paper are seen in Gaucher disease. So box of tissues for lipid-laden macrophages that resemble crumpled tissue paper. She decided to bring her Dalmatian dog to the party and he's been enjoying the sun as well. Notice that he has a spot shaped kind of like a spleen or liver. Just like in other images, this represents hepatosplenomegaly, which is another finding of Gaucher disease. Also notice that the dog has been enjoying this bone. Looks like he's been enjoying it a bit too much and finally snapped it in half. The broken bone alludes to the idea that Gaucher disease can cause bone disease, including osteoporosis, avascular necrosis of the femur, and bone crises. So broken bone for bone disease. Okay, notice that this girl brought her two kids to the birthday party. She has been a bit oblivious as she has been enjoying the sun because you can see that her kids have been up to no good. At first they went in the water and then afterwards they rolled around in the sand. The sand and mud have stuck to their bodies and now they have this brown stuff all over them that is super sticky and looks kind of like a brown glue. 
The sticky glue stuff sounds like gluco, and the sidewalk that they're on sounds like sidase. So putting these two ideas together, we get glucocerebrosidase and glucocerebroside. So glucocerebrosidase is the deficient enzyme, and glucocerebroside is the accumulated substrate. Because these sound so similar, we thought it would be best to just have one symbol for them. Also, because glucocerebroside is the deficient enzyme, recombinant glucocerebroside can be used in the treatment of Gaucher disease. Just like in other lysosomal storage diseases, we've included this lizard here to help remind you that this is a lysosomal storage disease. So lizard for lysosomal storage disease. And with that, you should have everything you need to know about Gaucher disease. Okay. Um, Dr. Carbasi, were you able, were you able to take the picture? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, Gaucher's disease. Ga uh, Gaucher's disease is uh, one of the most highest yield out of uh, all the one. Okay. So let's talk about Gaucher's disease over here. Gaucher's disease. What is the um, enzyme that is deficient in Gaucher's disease? Can I get some quick answers in the chat box, please? Which enzyme is deficient for Gaucher's disease? Glucocerebrosidase. <clears throat> Glucocerebrosidase, very good. What is the accumulated substance for Gaucher's disease? What is the accumulated substance for Gaucher's disease? Glucocerebroside. Okay. Uh, what are the clinical findings of Gaucher's disease? What are the clinical findings of Gaucher's disease? Pancytopenia, then bone necrosis, hepatosplenomegaly, then what else? What type of cells do we find over here in Gaucher's disease? Lipid laden. Macrophages resembling crumbled tissue paper. Crumbled tissue paper. Okay. These are known as these are known as Gaucher cells. Where do we find foam cells? Where do we find foam cells? Where do we find globoid cells? Globoid cells. Where do we find where do we find Gaucher uh, where do we find the crumbled tissue paper like macrophages? Gaucher's disease, Gaucher's disease. Okay, good. <clears throat> Let's come back over here. Okay. Gaucher's disease is the most common. That's why it's the most high yield. There's hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia, osteoporosis, avascular necrosis of the femur, bone crisis, Gaucher cells, which are lipid-laden macrophages resembling crumbled tissue paper. The accumulated substance is gluco, I mean, the deficient enzyme is glucocerebrosidase. And um, we can treat the patients with uh, glucocerebrosidase if um, the patients are responsive. And then the accumulated substrate is glucocerebroside, glucocerebroside over here. This is the accumulated substrate. <clears throat> okay, are we all clear about sphingolipidosis? Sphingolipidosis. Okay. Can we finish the lysosomal storage diseases by studying the next one? That is mucopolysaccharidosis, Hunter and Hurler syndrome. It's only one video. Okay. It's only one video. Then after that, we will do the revision and recapitulation of lysosomal storage diseases. Is everyone ready? Okay. Welcome to section 19. Okay, Dr. Grabasi, okay, you're ready. Let's begin. Point six of metabolism. In this video, we'll focus on memorizing the details of Hurler syndrome and Hunter syndrome. Let's get started. This scene will take place in Alaska as part of the infamous Iditarod trail sled dog race. The person here is taking a focus on memorizing the details of Hurler syndrome and Hunter syndrome. Let's get started. This scene will take place in Alaska 
as part of the infamous Iditarod trail sled dog race. The person here is taking a break from the race and is hurling javelins at the trees. Hurling sounds like hurler syndrome, so this will be our symbol for hurler syndrome. Notice that this athlete is wearing sunglasses to protect his eyes from the bright reflection of the snow. If you look closely, you can see that the blue clouds are reflecting off of the glasses. The glasses represent the cornea, and the cloud reflection represents corneal clouding. For step one, you should know that one of the clinical features of Hurdler syndrome is corneal clouding. So sunglasses with blue reflection for corneal clouding. In order to make javelin hurling an effective use of time, it would probably be a good idea to have some sort of target in order to assess accuracy, right? So in this story, our athlete character has placed a gargoyle target on the trees for this purpose. The gargoyle here should help you remember that one of the clinical features of Hurdler syndrome is gargoyalism. Gargoyalism refers to the dysmorphic facial features seen in Hurdler syndrome, including an upturned nose and thickened gums. So gargoyle for gargoyalism. Okay, let's zoom up on the gargoyle so you can see some of the details better. Notice that the gargoyle is pinned up against the tree at the hips with a little red pin. Hip pin sounds kind of like heparin sulfate. So this represents heparin sulfate, which is one of the accumulated substrates in Hurdler syndrome. This is also accumulated in Hunter syndrome, which we'll talk about in a second. So hip pin for heparin sulfate. Notice that the spelling of heparin is different from heparin. Heparin with an I-N is an anticoagulant. Heparin with an A-N is the accumulated substrate in Hurdler syndrome. Okay, while we're zoomed up on this gargoyle, let's discuss another point. Notice that one of the javelins is in the gargoyle's neck area. Obviously, the athlete needs a lot more practice because he totally missed the target. This javelin is here to help you remember that one of the clinical features of Hurdler syndrome is airway obstruction. So javelin in the neck for airway obstruction. Okay, now let's zoom out and continue with our story. If you've ever been at a target range or out to shoot for fun, you may have used cans for target practice. So in this story, we've added some used dirty cans that this athlete may use once his gargoyle target is obliterated. The dirty cans on the ground are here to help you remember that another accumulated substrate in Hurdler syndrome is dermatan sulfate. Dirty can sounds kind of like dermatan, so dirty cans for dermatan sulfate accumulation. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this scene takes place in Alaska as part of the Iditarod trail sled dog race. So we thought it would be appropriate to include a sled with dogs in the background. The Iditarod race with a sled back here is to help you remember that in Hurdler syndrome, the deficient enzyme is alpha l iduronidase Iditarod sounds like iduronidase so this sled should help you remember the deficient enzyme. Notice that the sled is in the background and at a lower level from where the athlete is. This is to help you remember that alpha l iduronidase is the deficient enzyme. So Iditarod race with the sled down low for low levels of alpha l iduronidase Okay, now let's turn our attention to this javelin stuck in the trunk of this small tree back here. This guy must be a terrible aim. Not only did he hit the gargoyle in the throat, but he also managed to hit this small tree that's at least 10 feet away from his target. Maybe he'll consider hiring a coach to help him out. Anyways, this javelin stuck in the small tree is here to help you remember that one of the clinical features of Hurdler syndrome is developmental delay. Notice that as you move back from the gargoyle to this small tree, the trees get progressively smaller. The tree that has been struck is the smallest tree and is obviously experiencing some sort of developmental delay compared to the trees around it. Also, the damage inflicted from the javelin will most likely delay its development even more. So javelin in the small tree for developmental delay. Because this is a sled dog race, it would be fitting to include some dogs in the image, right? So we've included this eager looking Dalmatian dog as part of the story to help you remember that one of the clinical features of Hurdler syndrome is hepatosplenomegaly. If you look closely at the dog, you'll notice this spot that is shaped like a liver. So liver spot for hepatosplenomegaly. Now we've added this old retired hunter guy sitting on the log, giving the athlete some pointers. Looks like he got a coach after all. Hopefully his aim will improve soon. From the image, you can tell that this hunter is retired because he looks old and he also has a gun bag sitting next to him. He isn't actually using his gun. He just brings it along in the gun case to teach others about hunting. So old hunter with gun case, for hunter syndrome. If you look closely at the gun case, you can see that there are multiple lizard designs inscribed in the case. The lizard is here to help you remember that both hunter and hurler syndromes are lysosomal storage diseases. So lizard for lysosomal storage disease. Hunter syndrome has been included in this image because it's very similar to hurler syndrome. 
In fact, the accumulated substrate, deficient enzyme, and clinical features are all similar, so we don't need to discuss those ideas again. However, Hunter syndrome is considered a mild form of Hurler syndrome, with a few differences which we'll discuss now. Notice that unlike the athlete who is wearing sunglasses, the retired hunter has glasses on top of his head. Also notice that they're not blue. They look completely clear. This alludes to the idea that there is no corneal clouding in Hunter syndrome. So clear glasses on top of head for no corneal clouding. The athlete character has a Dalmatian, but this retired hunter guy has a very aggressive looking German Shepherd. The aggressive dog is here to help you remember that one of the clinical features of Hunter syndrome is aggressive behavior. So aggressive dog for aggressive behavior. Okay, one last point. We have a separate video to help you memorize all of the X-linked recessive disorders, but you should know that Hunter syndrome and Fabry disease are X-linked recessive lysosomal storage diseases, while all of the other lysosomal storage diseases are autosomal recessive. Because we haven't included anything for Hurler syndrome, you can assume that it must be autosomal recessive. We also didn't want to include an X on this image to confuse the inheritance of Hurler and Hunter syndrome. However, recall from this image, which is to help you memorize all of the X-linked recessive disorders, that the old retired Hunter guy right here represents Hunter syndrome. Hopefully by remembering this image, you can recall that Hunter syndrome is an X-linked recessive disease. And with that, you should have everything you need to memorize about Hurler and Hunter syndromes. Okay. Dr. Corbasi, were you able to take the picture? Okay, good. Okay, so let's talk about uh, mucopolysaccharidosis. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> my apologies, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Okay, uh, are we ready to, to talk about mucopolysaccharidosis? Yes or no? Okay, good. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Hunter syndrome and Hurler syndrome. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, Hurler syndrome first, Hurler syndrome. Hurler syndrome, what is the deficient enzyme in Hurler syndrome? What is the deficient enzyme in Hurler syndrome? Alpha L iduronidase. <clears throat> alpha L iduronidase from the iduronid dogs over there. So alpha L iduronidase. What is the accumulated substance in and Her Hurler syndrome? What is the accumulated substance? It's heparin sulfate and dermatin sulfate. Okay, good. Now let's talk about Hunter syndrome. Hunter syndrome. What is the enzyme? that is deficient in, in Hunter syndrome? Enzyme that is deficient in Hunter syndrome. The enzyme that is deficient in Hunter syndrome is iduronic 2 sulfatase and the accumulated substance is the same, okay? <clears throat> How will you differentiate between Hunter syndrome and Hurler syndrome? How will you differentiate between Hunter and Hurler syndrome? Corneal clouding, one's there. Another one, corneal clouding is not there. Okay, what are the findings of Hurler syndrome? Hurler. What are the findings of Hurler syndrome? First of all, you have aggression. Then what else? In Hurler syndrome, you have gargoyleism. Very good. You have aggression in Hunter syndrome. Hurler syndrome, you have gargoyleism, corneal clouding, airway obstruction. Okay, good. Airway obstruction. Okay, so... Hurler syndrome, you have developmental delay, gargoyleism, airway obstruction, corneal clouding, hepatosplenomegaly. In Hunter syndrome, you have mild Hurler with aggressive behavior. Okay. And we talked about these two enzymes that are deficient. So now since we are done studying the lysosomal storage diseases, can we do a quick revision? Yes or no? Can we do a quick, quick revision? Okay. Okay. So we're going to ask the questions one by one. Okay, we're going to ask the questions one by one. Okay, um, everyone, are we ready to do the? Are we ready to do the revisions? Please use the chat box to answer me the questions. Okay, use the chat box to answer me the question. The first question goes to Dr. Abed Sheikh Yusuf. If you have a patient with uh, 
progressive neurodegeneration and cherry red spots in the macula and lysosomes with onion skin, what enzyme will you prescribe the patient to solve the problem? Fast answers, please. What enzyme will you prescribe the patient to solve the problem? Dr. Abed Sheikh Yusuf, fast answers, please. You have a patient with progressive neurodegeneration, cherry red spot, lysozymes with onion skin. Very good. You will prescribe the patient hexos and many days. Very good. Dr. Adam Abu Zaid, you have a patient with uh, progressive renal failure and has lysosomal storage, di storage disease. What is the diagnosis of this disease? Fast answers, please. Fast answers, please. Progressive renal failure and it's a lysosomal storage disease. What is the diagnosis? Fabry disease. Thank you so much. Next one is Dr. Adenom. You have a patient who has um, who has um, ataxia and dementia, and it's a lysosomal storage disease. What is the accumulated substance? What is the accumulated substance? Fast answers, please. What is the accumulated substance? Very good. Next one is Dr. Dahlia. You have a patient who has avascular necrosis of the bone. What deficient enzyme will you prescribe this patient after you have seen that this patient has macrophages with crumbled tissue paper appearance? What enzyme will you prescribe this patient? Glucose cerebrositis, very good. Next one is Dr. MS. If you have a patient who has cherry red spots in the macula and hepatosplenomegaly, what type of cells will you find in these patients? Very good. Next one is Dr. Han. If you have a patient who has the accumulation of the substance cycosine, what type of cells will you find in these patients? Fast answers, please. What type of cells? Globoid cells, not Gaucher cells. We are talking about Crabs disease. Okay, if you have the accumulated substance, cycosine, then the um, cells that you will find is globoid cells. Okay, next one. Ataxia with dementia is accumulated substance, cerebroside sulfate. Okay. Dr. Adenom's question, what was Dr. Adenom's question? Dr. Adenom, we asked you about cerebroside So We asked you about the, what did we ask you? We, one second, one second. Let me see what Dr. Adenom wrote. Oh, galactosabrosite, right. Dr. Adenom, no, your answer should have been, your answer should have been cerebroside sulfate. Okay, right, you're right. It should have been cerebroside sulfate, not galactosabrosite, okay? So you made a mistake, my apologies. I could not understand uh, you made the mistake, okay? I thought you wrote cerebroside sulfate. Okay, you guys are right, very good. Next one, next one is <clears throat> Dr. Osam. If you, if you have a patient with corneal clouding and um, airway obstruction with hepatosplenomegaly, what is the accumulated substance? Corneal clouding, keratin sulfate plus dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate. Dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate. Okay, good. Next one is Dr. Jordan. If you have a patient who has macrophages, lipid laden macrophages, uh, progressive neurodegeneration, and cherry red spots on the macula, what is your diagnosis? Lipid laden macrophages, progressive neurodegeneration, hepatosplenomegaly, Neiman Big disease. Very good. Next one is <clears throat> Dr. Lala. If you have a patient who has come to you with um, progressive, um, not progressive, if you, if you have a patient who comes to you with peripheral neuropathy, developmental delay and optic atrophy, along with presence of globoid cells, what is your diagnosis? Fast answers, please. Crabs disease, very good. Next one is Dr. Naud. If you have a patient who has come to you with um, <clears throat> if you if you have a patient who has come to you with central and peripheral demyelination with ataxia and dementia, what is your diagnosis? 
fast answers, please. Central peripheral edema, metachromatic leukodystrophy. Very good. Dr. Uday, if you have a patient who comes to you with progressive um, uh, development of peripheral neuropathy and your keratomas, right? And also they have hypohydrosis. What is your diagnosis? Hypohydrosis. Fast answers, please. Okay, very good, Dr. Ahmed. If you have a patient who comes to you with the development of lysozymes with onion skin appearance, along with progressive neurodegeneration, what is your diagnosis? Lysozymes with onion skin appearance and progressive, very good, Tay-Sachs disease. Dr. Karwasi, if you have a patient who comes to you with uh, the development of um, <clears throat> of the of, of a type of cell which has a crumbled tissue paper like appearance, crumbled tissue paper, what is the uh, enzyme that is deficient over here? Crumbled tissue paper like appearance. What enzyme is deficient over here? Glucocerebroside, very good. Dr. Dr. Ruba, if you have a patient who comes to you with, uh, de with development of hepatosplenomegaly along with lipid-laden macrophages and progressive neurodegeneration, what are, the, what are the other clinical findings you will look for in this patient? What are the other clinical findings you will look for in this patient? Patient has progressive neurodegeneration, presence of lipid latent macrophages, right? You will look for chair red spots and hepatosplenomegaly. Very good, next one. Next one is Dr. Savira. If you have a patient who comes to you with cherry red spots in the macula, how will you differentiate it between, between neiman pack and Tay-Sachs disease? Between neiman pick and Tay-Sachs disease? Hepatosplenomegaly and hepatosplenomegaly and what else? Foam cells, very good. Okay, Dr. Ibrahim, last question. If you have a patient who comes to you with the development of aggressive behavior, but without any corneal clouding, but the patient has mild developmental delay, what is your diagnosis? Aggressive behavior, hurler, it's not hurler, it's, it's not hurler syndrome. They have no corneal clouding, mild aggressive, I mean, mild uh, be, developmental delay and aggressive behavior, right? The answer is hunter syndrome, hunter syndrome, okay? Out of all of these syndromes, out of all of this, syn this syndrome, every one of these diseases, every one of, okay, Every one of these diseases are autosomal recessive except Hunter syndrome and Fabry disease. Okay, Fabry disease and Hunter syndrome, every, everything else is autosomal recessive. Are we clear about this, yes or no? Are we confident about the lysosomal storage diseases? Are we, oh, Dr. Hussein, did we miss you? My apologies. Okay, let me ask you a very difficult question. Okay, Dr. Hussein, my apologies, I am really sorry. Okay, I will ask you a normal question. Okay, my question to you is, um, <clears throat> okay, my question to you is, if you can answer this question, then you have the best mark out of all 18 students who are over here, okay. So you have a patient who comes to your clinic. The patient has um, increased the patient has increased uh, serum creatinine level. The patient has high CKMB, okay? The patient has high CKMB and increased serum creatinine. When you do a physical examination, you find that there are multiple macular spots on the patient's skin, okay? and when you do a peripheral uh, pin test, you find that the patient is oblivious to the peripheral sensations of the pin. What enzyme is deficient in this patient? 
high serum creatinine, high CKMB, patient has multiple spots on the skin. Please let Dr. Hussein answer, no one else should answer this. High CKMB, high serum creatinine, the patient has high, um, the patient has spots on the skin. Very good. Alpha galactosidus. What is your diagnosis? Febrile disease. Very good. Okay. Okay. So do you guys realize how there are multiple ways you can receive questions about lysosomal storage, storage diseases in the USMLE step one exam? Yes or no? Okay, good. Out of all the lysosomal storage diseases, the most important one is, okay, the most important one is Gaucher's disease, Tay-Sachs disease, neiman pig disease, and Febri disease to some extent, okay? These are very common, okay? Doctor, are these seven diseases rare or you find them clinically on a regular basis here in the USA? You find Tay-Sachs, which is pretty common. Gaucher is pretty common. Okay. Tay-Sachs is pretty common. Gaucher is pretty common. Okay. Are we clear about this? Okay. Okay. So can we begin with the glycogen storage diseases? Everyone? Glycogen storage diseases, okay. So the same way that we studied the lysosomal storage diseases, we will study the glycogen storage diseases. <clears throat> First of all, before we talk about the glycogen storage diseases, let's talk about this. Glycogen, as you can see over here, that, that the, the, the glycogen, the branches have alpha 1, 6 bonds, the branches, they have alpha 1, 6 bonds and the linkage have, has alpha 1, 4 bonds. When we say 1, 6 and 1, 4, we mean that the bonds are there at the first and sixth position and the linkage bonds are there at the first and fourth positions of the carbon atom. <clears throat> okay. Um, the skeletal muscle, they have the glycogen undergoes glycogenolysis in the skeletal muscle, meaning that Glycogen, first of all, what is glycogen? Can we assume that the glucose is stored in the product that is, that is glycogen? Yes or no? Yes or no? Is glucose stored in, in the form of glycogen? Okay, good. So glycogen undergoes glycogenolysis. So can we say that when we need a high amount of glucose or energy supply, this glycogen can be broken down to give us the glucose supply? Yes? Okay. So glycogen undergoes glycogenolysis, results in the formation of glucose 1-phosphate. And glucose 1-phosphate, when you have formation of glucose 1-phosphate, can we assume that this undergoes in, into the gluconeogenetic pathway or the glycolytic pathway, right? Because in, from glucose 1-phosphate, you have glucose 6-phosphate. From glucose 6-phosphate, you have glucose. What enzyme is, uh, is, is helping the conversion of glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate? Can you get some fast answers, please? Glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. Very good. Phosphoglucomutase. Phosphoglucomutase. Okay, good. Which is rapidly met metabolized during the exercise. Glycogen. The glycogen is stored in the liver also, and it, un and it undergoes glycogenolysis to maintain blood sugar at appropriate levels. Glycogen phosphorylase, glycogen phosphorylase in the liver will liberate glucose 1-phosphate residues of branched glycogen until four glucose units remain on a branch. So. What they will do is basically glycogen phosphorylase will liberate, liberate means they will get rid of the glucose until only four remains, until only four remains of the branch. This is not high yield, so don't worry about it, just read through this. Then four alpha D gluconotransferase, the D branching enzyme, the four alpha D gluconotransferase, which we will study in um, the glycogen storage, storage diseases, these are the D branching enzyme, they will debranch the enzyme and move three of the four glucose units from the branch to the linkage. So basically you have 
uh, debranching enzyme. If we talk about debranching enzymes, then debranching enzymes will break off the branches of the glycogen, and they, this they will help with the moving of three to four glucose units from the branches to the linkage. Then alpha one six glucosidase will cleave of the last residue, liberating the glucose. So what's happening over here? Let's talk again. What's happening in uh, the, the hepatocytes, that is the liver. First of all, you have the glycogen, which is being broken down by glycogen phosphorylase. After it's being broken down by glycogen phosphorylase, you have four alpha D gluconotransferase, which moves three to four glucose remits to the linkage. And then when they're shifted to the linkage, then this one, this enzyme, that is what alpha one six glucosidase, will debranch and cleave the last residue, liberating the glucose. I know this, this sounds a bit uh, complex right now, but after we study the glycogen storage diseases, it will make a lot more sense. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. And to be honest, you guys will not receive many questions on any questions for that matters from this reaction over here. This is not a very high yield reaction. The most important stuff is, uh, uh, is um, acknowledging and understanding what clinical findings are, also, are associated with, with which glycogen storage diseases and how will you treat them. Limit dextrin refers to the two of the four residues remaining on a branch after glycogen phosphorylase has already shortened it. Glycogen storage disease are type one, which is known as von Gieg's disease, type two, Pompe's disease, type three, Cori's disease, and type five is McCurdle's disease, okay? Okay, so are we ready to begin with the glycogen storage diseases? Yes or no? Okay. We will only discuss only four types of glycogen storage diseases, but as a, as, a, as a total, you have 15 types of glycogen storage disorders. You have 15 types of glycogen storage disorders, all resulting in abnormal glycogen metabolism and accumulation of glycogen within the cells. Now, if you have to identify glycogen within the cells, you guys remember that in GI system, we talked about the fact how PAS stain or, P or periodic acid shift stain will identify the glycogen in uh, the tissues, yes or no? Do you guys remember we talked about periodic acid shift stain, how it, right. So, so PAS stain, this is extremely important for your USMLE step one exam because you will have a lot of question where they will tell you that, they, that some of the tissues are PAS positive. When they talk about PAS positive, and it's a biochemistry question I need you to think about. I need you to think about glycogen storage diseases, glycogen storage diseases, PAS positive stain for glycogen storage diseases, okay? They have a mnemonic over here, which is very poor carbohydrate metabolism. This stands for Von Gierks, Pompey's, Cori's, and McArdle's disease. Are we ready to begin with uh, the glycogen storage diseases? Yes or no? Okay. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to uh, look at the two videos at the same time. There are only two videos for glycogen storage diseases in physio. Each video contains uh, two of the diseases in them. So we will only have to watch two videos. So let's do that. And after that, then we will discuss the whole glycogen storage diseases, okay? Okay, Dr. Krabasi, are we ready? Okay. Welcome to section. Okay, is everyone ready? Is everyone ready? If, if they are, can I get a yes? Thank you. Okay, so let's begin. 7.1 of metabolism. In this video, we will focus on memorizing the details of two glycogen storage diseases, von Gierke's disease and Cori disease. Let's get started. 
Our story occurs in a pleasant little candy land. Notice that the trees look like candy. Now these trees are cut down and harvested by the people of this area. When the candy is chopped up, the townspeople are provided with lots of sugar, or glucose. In this way, each candy tree represents glycogen. When it gets chopped up and harvested, glucose is produced. Now the people of this town are typically very happy. However, one day, things go horribly wrong when the truck carrying a large load of freshly cut candy trees breaks. See all of these candy tree logs barreling down the hill? Well, as these roll down, they crash into this very important machine. This is the glucose 6-phosphatase machine. You can even see its title right here on the machine. Now, G6PAs, or glucose 6-phosphatase, is used to break glucose 6-phosphate into glucose for the body. When there is a deficiency in glucose 6-phosphatase, patients develop von Guericke disease. Now, this G6PAs machine normally takes the glycogen candy tree and breaks it down into glue. The glue bottles are then produced from the machine, travel down the conveyor belt, and deposit into brown boxes at the end of the line. Now this image demonstrates glycogen breakdown and is discussed in section 7 of metabolism. Glucose 6-phosphatase is right here. See how it converts glucose 6-phosphate into glucose. And this little star represents von Guericke disease. Now since this machine normally takes the glycogen and puts out glucose, with it broken, we won't get any glucose, which is represented in this image by glue. So all the empty boxes without the glue that should be in them represents hypoglycemia. And this is very important to know because normally people need glycogen to break down glucose when they're fasting. So when patients with von Guericke disease fast, their body tries to break down glycogen, but they can't. So they end up not having enough glucose and they have severe fasting hypoglycemia. And going back to our story, you can imagine that not having enough glue can create a whole host of problems for our candy workers. For example, look at this acid spewing from the machine onto this unlucky peppermint worker. When the acid gets on him, it causes him to poop himself. For this reason, the peppermint candy workers call this type of acid laxative acid. This laxative acid represents lactic acidosis, which occurs in patients without functional glucose 6-phosphatase, which is a direct result of not having enough glucose. Now let's look at these little purple balls falling out of the machine. These represent periodic acid shift stains. Now, periodic acid shift stains, or PAS stains, stain purple in the presence of glycogen. And with glycogen building up in various organs, especially in the liver, you can take a biopsy of the liver, then do a PAS stain, and if you see bright purple, that indicates there's lots of glycogen stored within the liver. Now, this is a histological slide of a liver biopsy containing a PAS positive stain. The bright purple you see shows glycogen is present. As I just mentioned, glycogen builds up in the liver, causing it to enlarge. Notice this cute little Dalmatian dog with a big liver spot. This will help you remember that in glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency, or von Guericke disease, glycogen builds up in the liver. The absence of all the glue is very serious for the candy people. In a panic, this peppermint worker carelessly slips on a brick of butter. This butter represents high triglycerides. Butter, after all, is loaded with triglycerides. So when you remember this panicking peppermint worker, remember that in patients with glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency, they have high levels of triglycerides in their blood. Now, during the descent of these glycogen logs, the toe of this poor worker was smashed. Look how big and swollen it is. This big red swollen toe represents gout, which is caused by high levels of uric acid in the blood, or hyperuricemia. So, big red toe, or hyperuricemia. Another candy worker was injured when a log rolled over him, and it caused his leg to break off. Now, these candy workers, as you can imagine, based on what they're made of, have knees that break all the time. And normally, they just glue themselves back together. However, they are clearly out of glue. You could say there is no glue for his knee, or no gluconeogenesis. Thus, his leg remains separated. Now this highlights a very important idea that patients with glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency don't have proper gluconeogenesis, which we discussed before. Although there is no glue for this damaged peppermint, this kind friend is offering a gallon of figs. Not a great consolation, but it's a sweet thought. You can see the volume of the container is identified clearly with the label GAL. For our purposes, GAL stands for galactose. Now let's discuss the figs in this gallon. Figs contain lots of fructose. In fact, among all fruits, figs are right there at the top in terms of concentration of fructose. So whenever you think of figs, think fructose. It's super convenient that they both start with the letter F. Fig fructose. In any case, this broken victim is kindly refusing the gallon of figs. His refusal represents a very critical idea. Fructose and galactose must be avoided in these patients. That's because both of these monosaccharides only make things worse in patients with glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency. So again, peppermint refusing a gallon of figs for avoiding fructose and galactose. Now look over to the right of the image. These workers are made of a completely different kind of candy. So they represent a different type of disease, Cori disease. Now these candy corn workers are hard at work, removing the branches from the glycogen tree. 
In this way, they are debranching the tree. This represents the fact that the debranching enzyme is deficient in patients with Cori disease. So again, candy corns debranching the glycogen tree at the corner. And the debranching enzyme is identified right here. And that blue star correlates with the blue star down here representing Cori disease. Now most of these linkages, as you can see, are alpha-1-4 linkages. However, this strange linkage right here is an alpha-1-6 linkage. So this debranching enzyme breaks this alpha-1-6 link, which is why we consider it a debranching enzyme. To reinforce this idea, we have this little helper measuring the angle of the branch with a protractor, and he yells, six degrees. This will help you remember that the debranching enzyme breaks the alpha-1-6 linkage, not the typical alpha-1-4 linkage like the other enzymes. So candy corns debranch the alpha-1-6 linkages at the corner. Now a lack of debranching enzyme is often considered a milder form of the condition demonstrated on the left of the image. However, it is not without its challenges. Without the ability to debranch, glycogen builds up. Again, mostly in the liver. So this little spotted Dalmatian dog has a prominent liver spot to help you remember glycogen buildup. Now this cute little candy corn is flying a kite. This kite represents ketoacidosis, which is common in these patients. Notice how he is trying to get the attention of the peppermint getting sprayed by the laxative acid. He's trying to get his attention so he can cheer him up. It's a kind gesture, but it cost him dearly. While he was distracted, his kite flew right into the leg of his fellow candy corn, breaking it horribly. See all of these little purple balls bleeding from his wound? These again represent periodic acid shift stains, which are positive in glycogen liver biopsies in these patients. Fortunately for the debranching candy corn workers, they still have enough glue with which to glue their knees. And this little candy corn worker gluing his knee will help you remember that gluconeogenesis is intact in Cori disease. And with that, you have completed the image containing all the details of two glycogen storage diseases, von Guericke disease, glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency, and Cori disease, debranching enzyme deficiency. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Corbassi, were you able to take a picture? Okay, good. Do you guys realize how easy this whole thing becomes when you see the picture? Yes or no? Do you guys think this, this, this becomes easy or not? Because this picture is very, very easy and it's very descriptive of uh, the von Gierke disease and the Cori disease. Okay, are we all clear about this? Does everyone find this easy or not easy? Glycogen storage diseases. Can we get some feedbacks, please? Can we get some feedbacks from the students? How do you feel? Easy or not easy after watching the picture mnemonics? Okay. Do you realize that if you were to read this line by line, right? And then read this and then read this and then come back and then read lysosomal storage diseases, how confusing it, it, it would have been if there is no picture associated with it. Now that there's a picture associated with this whole thing, this thing becomes really easy. So before we jump into the text of, uh, that is this one over here, can we finish the next 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 video about Pompe's disease and McCurdle's disease before we jump into the text? So that we will be done with today's videos. Yes or no? Okay. Please finish the text first. Okay. Okay, so let's let's read the text. First of all, let's read the text that is von Gierke's disease, type one von Gierke's disease. First of all, von Gierke's disease. Do you guys remember that we talked about the fact how glucose six phosphate is converted to glucose by the enzyme glucose six phosphatase? Yes or no? Glucose six phosphatase. Yes or no? Fast answers, please. If we do not have that glucose six phosphatase enzyme, then we have a disease that is known as von Gierke's disease. Von Gierke's disease over here. So what happens if we have a patient with glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency? Can we say that these patients can get fasting hypoglycemia? So basically what happens during fasting, what happens during fasting is during fasting, the glycogen is broken down to form glucose, yes or no? Uh, is the glycogen broken down to form glucose? Yes. So if you have glucose 6-phosphatase defici deficiency, can the glycogen form glucose from glucose 6-phosphate? Yes or no? No, so this, these patients have severe fasting hypoglycemia. 
Next one is there will be increased glycogen in the liver and increased glycogen in the, in the kidneys. This makes sense because this increased amount of glycogen is not converted to glucose. So they will remain stored. So as a result, can we say that the tissues in the livers and kidneys, they will have PAS positive stain? Yes or no? PAS positive stain, right. Along with this, they will have increase in blood lactate and triglycerides. Why will there be increase in blood lactate and triglyceride, which we just saw from over here, right? With the lactic acid and triglyceride over here and hyperuricemia, where was hyperuricemia? Hyperuricemia over here, right? Do you, do you understand these uh, picture mnemonics from over here? The acid, triglyceride and the hyperuricemia, right? Why are these things happening? These things are happening. This is because when glycogen cannot be broken down to glucose, they are shifted to an, another pathway. They are, they are shifted to the lactic acid pathway, fatty acid synthesis pathway, and uric acid synthesis pathway. So the glycogen is shifted off, basically. And then you have hepatomegaly because the glycogen gets stored over there and the liver does not regulate the blood glucose. So how do you treat these patients? Can we say that these patients, the first thing that you have to do is you have to avoid fasting, right? First thing is avoid, avoid fasting. Then next one is since these patients, they do not have glucose, can we give them glucose, oral glucose? Yes? Yes or no? Can we give them oral glucose? Right, yes, we have to give them oral glucose, oral glucose or cornstarch. But can we give them fructose and galactose? Can we give them fructose and galactose? Why can we give them fructose and galactose? Because this fructose and galactose cannot be converted to glucose, right? Cannot be broken down, cannot, cannot be converted to glucose. They, so they are stored as more glycogen. And this can result in progression of the disease. That is von Gehr's disease, okay? Over here, you have impairment of gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Because this enzyme is the common enzyme in both gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about von Gehr's disease? Okay, good. The next disease we studied was Cori's disease, right? We studied Cori's disease. We studied von Gehr's and Cori's disease together because these two are very similar. What's happening in Cori's disease is why, what, What's your question? What is your question? What is the cause of increased uric acid over here? Uric acid is um, basically what happens is uh, over here, the uric acid, first of all, the uric acid, it, it cannot be broken down. The, the uric acid over here, it cannot be broken down. And, and another one is the glycogen, the excess amount of glycogen is more or less, when it stays for a long period of time, it's converted to lactic acid triglyceride, and to some extent, it's shifted to the uric acid synthesis pathway. So there's increased amount of uric acid hyperuricemia. The cause is not very high yield in that matter, but, it, but, the, fi but the fact that you get gout in von Gehr's disease, that is pretty important. Are we clear about this? Are we clear about this? Okay, next one we were studying was Cori's disease. In Cori's disease, it's a type three glycogen storage disease. And we studied Cori's disease with von Gehr's disease because it's very similar because the sign symptoms will overlap. It's similar to von Gehr's disease, but milder symptoms and the blood lactate level is normal over here. There will, no, there, there will not be lactic acidosis. But what would happen is over here, there is cardiomyopathy. This can lead to cardiomyopathy limit dextrin like structures will accumulate in the cytosol. This is actually pretty high yield. Okay, over here, the limit dextrins are broken down forms of the glycogen. And at times you will receive questions uh, in, your, in your exam where they will tell you that you have a patient who has uh, PAS positive stains in the livers and tissues. And along with this, the patient has limit dextrin. The patient has limit dextrin. What is your diagnosis? Your diagnosis is Cori's disease, not von Gehr's disease. Why is there accumulation of limit dextrin? There's accumulation of limiting dextrin because the enzyme that is deficient is alpha 1,6 glucosidase. Alpha 1,6 glucosidase. This one is more high yield. 
you will not receive any questions about 4-alpha d gluconotransferase. You will receive questions only about alpha 1-6 glucosidase. If alpha 1-6 glucosidase is not there, the glycogens cannot be deep branched and they will stay as limit dextrins in the cytosol. Will gluconeogenesis still take place? Yes or no? Will gluconeogenesis still take place? Yes. Why? Because glucose 6-phosphate Glucose 6-phosphatase will be working over here. Glucose 6-phosphatase will be working over here. So the patients will not get a lot of fasting hypoglycemia. Are we clear about this? Okay. Everyone, are we clear about this now? Okay. Now can we finish the next two videos and come back to the text? Okay, uric acid in von Gehrig's disease, what happens is that patients, they have hyperuricemia because what happens is there is, um, uh, there is increased formation and decreased excretion of uric acid because this has happened, this, this happens because if when we study the pentose phosphate pathway or the uh, HMP pathway, we will, see, we will see that the uric acid is generated when increased amount of G6-phosphate are metabolized. So G6-phosphate, meaning that glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, when they are metabolized, for example, glucose 6-phosphate right now in this uh, von Gehrig's disease, they cannot be broken down by glucose 6-phosphatase to form glucose. Am I correct? Yes or no? Am I correct? Can glucose 6-phosphate be broken down? No, in von Gehrig's disease they cannot be broken down. So what happens is they enter the HMP, I mean the pentose phosphate uh, pathway, right? The HMP pathway, and uh, they are metabolized in that pathway. And in that pathway, when we talk about this in the future, we will see that the glucose 6-phosphate, it gets shifted to the pentose phosphate pathway. And in the pentose phosphate pathway, the glucose 6-phosphate is converted to high amount of uric acid, and this results in hyperuricemia. Okay, are we clear now? Yes, ketoacidosis in, 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 in Cori's disease, but they did not mention this in first aid. They did not mention this in first aid, but um, they mentioned this in physio. So over here, you have lactic acidosis. Over here, you have ketoacidosis. Okay. okay. Is everyone clear about this? Are you guys clear? Okay. Are you guys clear about hyperuricemia in von Gehrig's disease, why it's happening? Because the glucose 6-phosphate gets shifted to pentose phosphate and over there in that pathway, it's metabolized to form high amount of uric acid. Okay. Can we begin the, with the next two videos? With the next video, my apologies. There's only one more video over here. Dr. Savira, is it okay now? Have you understood now the, the text? Have you understood the text now? Okay, good. So let's begin with the next one that is Pompe's disease and McCurdle's disease. Okay. Welcome to. Is everyone ready? If they are, can I get a yes, please, on the chat box? Okay. Dr. Krabasi, are you ready? Okay. Section 7.2 of metabolism. In this video, we will focus on memorizing the details of Pompe disease and McCardle disease. Let's get started. Now the Pompe and McCardle diseases will continue the candy theme that we created for the other glycogen storage diseases, von Gierke and Cori disease. So let's start off our story with McCardle disease. This is a deficiency of glycogen phosphorylase. Just like in the former video, glycogen is represented by the candy cane tree. See how it's big and when it's chopped up, little pieces of sugar or glucose are released. Now look at this chainsaw made of flowers. This represents glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase is an enzyme that normally breaks linkages within glycogen, producing glucose 1-phosphate. So again, this flower chainsaw represents a deficiency in glycogen phosphorylase. You can see glycogen phosphorylase right here. The star indicates that a deficiency here can cause McCardle disease, which is labeled down below. 
Now notice the debris of purple balls. These represent periodic acid shift stains, which stain purple in the presence of glycogen. With glycogen building up in various organs of these patients, a biopsy specimen can be stained with PAS and reveal a bright purple color, which indicates that there is a lot of glycogen present. Glycogen phosphorylase is found in skeletal muscle. Notice this donut character shredding muscles. He is a strong donut, but his muscles shouldn't be coming apart like that. With the deficiency of glycogen phosphorylase, skeletal muscles don't receive an adequate supply of glucose 1-phosphate from glycogen. This causes the muscles to break down, especially in strenuous exercise. And personally, I would consider lifting a giant candy log above my head, strenuous exercise. Unfortunately, a donut worker was high up in the tree as it was getting chopped down. This caused him to fall rapidly, crashing into a branch. Looking closely, you can see looking at this donut's crotch, red jelly is spilling out. This represents myoglobinuria, or myoglobin in the urine. Now myoglobin is a protein in muscle associated with oxygen delivery, and when muscle becomes damaged, this protein leaks out into the blood and then in the urine. Within urine, myoglobin appears visibly red. So this red jelly coming out can help you remember the red myoglobin urine in these patients. To cheer on the glycogen phosphorase brigade, this donut rides in on his cotton candy dog. Notice this dog is chewing a bone, breaking it down into calcium crystals. These calcium crystals represent how calcium can upregulate glycogen phosphorylase. This makes sense because calcium is very important for skeletal muscle to adequately complete contractions. So calcium crystals and cheering on the workers will help you remember that calcium upregulates glycogen phosphorylase in skeletal muscle. Now these donut workers are very responsible. They take branches from the glycogen trees and glue them onto stumps left behind. In this way, they can replenish the forest after they complete their work. This glue here will help you remember that glucose is normal in these patients. This makes sense because their liver is totally fine. This is really just a skeletal muscle issue. Now let's bring on our Pompeii disease characters. Notice these little lizards help out the operation by managing the loading of glycogen logs onto the truck. These lizards represent lysosomes. The most important part of this information text box here is to help you recognize that this disease occurs in lysosomes. So lizards for lysosomes. But to elaborate on what's written here, you can see that the enzyme that is deficient within lysosomes is alpha-1,4 glucosidase. When this enzyme is deficient, lysosomes cause all kinds of problems many unique to Pompeii disease. Now don't worry about the alpha-1,4 linkage right here because on the next slide, we have a way to help you remember this. Which brings us to our next part. This careless lysosome lizard dropped a log, crushing a car. Throughout our images in physio, we like to use cars to help you remember cardiac problems. Car, cardiac. So with this car getting damaged, this reinforces the idea that cardiomyopathy and cardiomegaly happen in Pompeii disease. Don't get wrapped up in cardiomyopathy versus cardiomegaly just know that lysosomes fill up with glycogen and damage the heart. So damaged car for cardiac problems. Now as promised, here is the memory hook for the alpha-1,4 glucosidase. Notice there are four tires flying up from the car when it gets crushed. This emphasizes the alpha-1,4 glucosidase function of the lysosomes. See alpha-1,4 glucosidase here. This enzyme is in the lysosomes, as written. This star corresponds to the star below for Pompeii disease. Notice how most of these linkages are alpha-1,4 linkages. Reviewing McCardle disease really quickly, glycogen phosphorylase also breaks down these alpha-1,4 linkages. In this way, alpha-1,4 glucosidase and glycogen phosphorylase are very similar enzymes. But as you can see, McCardle disease with the glycogen phosphorylase chainsaw and Pompeii disease with the lysosome lizards lead to very different syndromes. But again, four tires for alpha-1,4 glucosidase deficiency. Notice in all the chaos, passenger side door came unhinged. This door is shaped a lot like a liver. This liver door will help you remember that when lysosomes cannot adequately break down glycogen, it will build up in the liver. Contrast this to the donut glycogen phosphorylase deficiency on the left, which does not have any symbols for the liver. That's because glycogen does not build up in the liver with glycogen phosphorylase deficiency. Now notice all the purple balls falling from the car as a result of this damage. Again, these represent the purple stain of glycogen with a periodic acid shift stain of biopsies. Now to help fix the situation, these lysosome lizards are trying to glue the front fender back to the car. Notice they are using glue. Glue stands for glucose. The fact that these lizards have glue readily available helps reinforce the idea that glucose and gluconeogenesis are fully functional in Pompeii disease. So again, patients with Pompeii disease or deficiency of alpha-1,4 glucosidase in lysosomes will have normal glucose levels. So as you can see, without this enzyme, glycogenolysis to the left 
should remain normal. Therefore, they should have normal glucose levels. Now, in spite of the difficulties that the lysosome lizards have here loading the logs onto the truck, they still feel pretty cool. This guy is even flexing in front of the donut character in an attempt to show off his muscles. Unfortunately, his demonstration was lackluster, as you can see with his poor muscular tone. Now, these wispy lizard arms will help you remember hypotonia occurs in patients with alpha-1,4 glucosidase deficiency. Now for the last idea. Now, as demonstrated on this image, notice that the lysosomes can break the alpha-1,4 linkage and just head off in this direction, whereas the typical flow goes down in this direction. So in this way, lysosomes seem kind of sneaky. They just break off a piece and take off. As you can see over here with these lizards, they can just bite off a piece of the glycogen tree and get on their merry way. So basically, they just break the alpha-1,4 linkage and get the glucose themselves. And with that, you have learned all of the information that you need to memorize for McCardell disease and Pompe disease. Okay, Dr. Grabasi, were you able to take the picture? Okay, good. Okay, so let's talk about Pompe's disease and McCardell's disease. Okay, let's talk about Pompe's disease and McCardell's disease. Pompe's disease, number one. Pompe's disease, the division enzyme over here is alpha 1 4 glucosidase or acid maltase and or acid maltase. Um, which part of the video did we see to remember the enzyme that, that is alpha 1 4 glucosidase? Can I get some fast answers, please? How, how do you remember alpha 1 4 glucosidase from the, enz from the video? Pompe's disease? Four tires. Very good. <clears throat> Very good. Okay, so acid maltase over there. Uh, did, 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 did everyone understand from the video? Tires, one, two, three, four, alpha, one, four, glucosidase, yes or no? Did everyone understand? Yes, okay, good. What are the findings? The findings, number one, is cardiomegaly. Do you guys remember that from the video, you have the car? So cardiomegaly, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypotonia, exercise intolerance, and early death. Do you remember we solved a U-World question in our U-World notes yesterday about, about muscle weakness and um, muscle weakness and heart failure? And we asked you which glycogen storage did, disease that was. It was Pompe's disease. Okay. Good. With normal glucose. All right. That's correct. Next one is McArdle's disease. McArdle's disease is very high yield. McArdle's disease is very high yield. Do you guys remember that from the video, you saw that the most important um, enzyme that is deficient over here is glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase is deficient over here. If glycogen phosphorylase is deficient, what would happen is when the muscle needs to break down glucose, first of all, does muscle have uh, glycogen stored in them? Yes or no, the skeletal muscle, we, we, how we saw in the first page, right? When the muscles need to break down that glycogen to give that extra amount of glucose or that energy, if there is glycogen phosphorylase that is deficient, can the muscle break down the glycogen? Yes or no? And no. So what would happen is there's increased glycogen stored in the skeletal muscle, which will come in the exam by the fact that they will tell you that, that there is PAS positive in the skeletal muscle, PAS positive tissues in the skeletal muscle. And with that, the, these patients, they will have painful muscle cramps. These patients, they will have painful muscle cramps. And, and, and along with this, what happens in a muscle when they contract without any energy? Can we assume that uh, there's a possibility that those muscles will start breaking off, have, will have micro tears? Yes or no? Yes, so this micro tears results in the formation of myoglobinuria. Myoglobinuria, especially the breakdown products of muscle globin, myoglobin, with strenuous exercise, can occur and this can result in myoglobinuria. And another thing is when there's breakdown of muscles, can, can we assume that uh, there is also a high amount of potassium, hyperkalemia when there's muscle breakdown? Muscle breakdown, can, right. So this hyperkalemia, high potassium, right? They will cause arrhythmia. They will cause arrhythmia. And another one is there's an, another thing called second wind phenomenon. Second wind phenomenon. What happens is, when there is increased uh, muscle blood, when there's increased blood flow, when there's increased blood flow once again, okay, the muscles, they start, uh, con they start contracting again. They start contracting again and, um, the, and, the, and the pain, and the pain, it subsides. Okay, this is known as second wind phenomenon. This is not very high yield. The most high yield one is myoglobinuria. 
and PAS positive in the um, skeletal muscle and uh, muscle cramps. There will be muscle cramps. Uh, and along with this, the, this whole scenario can be characterized by a flat venous lactate curve with normal rise in ammonia levels during exercise. You will receive one question about this in UWorld. One question only, that they will have a lactate curve with normal rise in, in, in ammonia. Lactate curve with a normal rise in ammonia. And this will sh this shows that these patients have McArdle's disease. Okay, lactate curve with a flat lactate curve with a normal rise in, in, in ammonia. So basically something like this. If there's like a lactate curve like this, there will be like a normal rise in ammonia. So this sort of a scenario will show that it's a, that it's a McArdle's disease. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Everyone, did we understand the glycogen storage diseases? Okay. So if you have a patient with fasting hypoglycemia, the patient, what is your diagnosis? Extreme fasting hypoglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, hyperuricemia. What is your diagnosis? Von Gage disease. If you have a patient with muscle weakness and cardiomyopathy, what is your diagnosis? Muscle weakness and cardiomyopathy. Okay. If you have a patient who has come to you, if you, if you have a patient who has come to you with milder symptoms of von Gage disease, mild symptoms of von Gage, Gage disease, which enzyme is deficient over here? Which enzyme is deficient? Mild symptoms of von Gage disease. Debranching enzyme, very good. If you have a patient who comes to you with um, acute renal failure and acute renal failure and severe muscle cramp, what is your diagnosis? McArdle disease, okay? Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Yes, okay, good. Second wind phenomenon. Second wind phenomenon is basically there the muscle cramps that happen, they can subside when there is it, when there is when there is restoration of blood flow to the muscle. When the muscles work out, I mean when there's flow to the to the muscle again. Okay, that is second wind event phenomenon. Okay. Is it clear? Okay, not very high yield, so don't worry about it. Okay. So with that being said, can we take a do you, do you guys want to take a small break? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes. Do you guys want to do a do you guys want to do a regular lecture time today or do you guys want to decrease the lecture time because it's the 1st of Jan and it's a new year? Can, can I get some feedback, please? You guys want to decrease the lecture time for today? Oh. Okay. Nope, it's not possible to finish biochemistry today. Okay. Okay, normal time. Okay, fine. Then let's take a break for 15 minutes and then let's come back. After we come back, then we'll start with our regular discussion from all the way over here. Right now, it will not take us a lot of time because we are done with all the major pathways and we are done with glycogen storage diseases and lysosomal storage diseases. And that is about 60% of biochemistry metabolism. Am I clear? Uh, am I right? To all the students who have studied biochemistry before, the fact that we have finished the cycle and we have finished glycogen storage disease and lysosomal storage disease, can we say that we are confident about the cycles, lysosomal storage disease and glycogen storage diseases? Yes or no? Are we confident? Okay. Can we assume that since we have finished with the cycle and the two types of diseases, we have covered close to around 50, 60% of biochemistry? Okay, so let's take a break and then let's come back. Okay, did you guys understand the lecture for biochemistry that we have done? 
Can I get some responses, please? Okay. Has watching the videos on physio made it more easier and fun than just reading uh, lately? Okay. Okay, good. So let's take that break. Let's take a break for 15 minutes and let's come back.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. <clears throat> oh, okay, good. So, um, okay, so since we took quite a long break for 15 to 20 minutes, can we start with uh, the lecture right now? Yes or no? Okay, is everyone ready? Okay, good. So let's start with the lecture. So we're done with uh, talking about the pathways over here. And uh, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is ATP production. ATP production is basically, if you break down one molecule of glucose in the presence of oxygen, that is Arabic metabolism, you will produce 32 net ATP via the malate aspartate shuttle, that is the heart and liver. What would happen is you would produce 32 ATP via the malate aspartate shuttle and 30 net ATP via the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle in the muscle. So you have two types of shuttle that's working over here in the heart and muscle. In the heart and liver, you have malate aspartate shuttle. And in the, in the muscles, you have glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. Uh, we'll talk about this in the future. Just keep this in mind that you will produce 32 for, you will produce 32 for heart and liver and 30 for the skeletal muscle. Keep this in mind, we'll talk about the shuttles in the future. In anaerobic glycolysis, for example, in the absence of oxygen, you will produce two ATP only per glucose molecule. So ATP hydrolysis can be coupled to energetically unfavorable reactions. That's that. If you have an arsenic poisoning, this can cause glycolysis to produce zero ATP. This is high yield. This is high yield, okay? So in Arabic metabolism, in the heart and muscle, you will produce 32. In the, I mean, in the heart and liver, you will produce 32. In the muscles, you will produce 30. In the anaerobic, you will produce two. And in arsenic, you will produce zero. The fact that arsenic causes glycolysis to produce zero ATP is extremely high yield. Please keep this in mind. Are we clear about this, yes or no? How will you receive questions about this? You will receive questions about this in the sense that they will tell you that you have a patient who has a problem with uh, the glycolytic pathway in which the net ATP produced is zero. What type of poisoning is this? And your answer is arsenic poisoning. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay, all right. Okay, next one. Next one is activated carriers. Activated carriers, activated carriers, you have ATP molecules, okay? This is a not very high yield, but this is just for your understanding that ATP molecules, it's, it, 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 these are carried in activated forms, that is in phosphoryl groups. NADPH and NAD, these are used in the electron transport chains. So these are ca carried in forms of electrons. CoA is carried in form of acyl groups, tetrahydrofolate is one carbon unit. This is high yield. Tetrahydrofolate, this is carried in one carbon unit. This is high yield. You will receive one question about this in U-World only. Tetrahydrofolate is carried in one carbon unit. So basically activated forms are, these are the forms in which ATP is carried. For example, for example the whole form of ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So they are carried in phosphoryl groups. NADPH is carried in electrons. CoA is carried in SL groups. Biotin is carried in, in the form of carbon dioxide. Tetrahydrofolate is carried in the form of one carbon atom. The fact that tetrahydrofolate is carried in one carbon atom, this is high yield. This is one question. Next one is s adenosyl methanine is carried in the form of methyl group CH3. And TPP is pyrophosphate. These are carried in the form of aldehydes. None of them is, uh, is extremely high yield, to be honest, except this one over here. So please keep this in mind, that tetrahydrofolate is carried in the form of one carbon atom. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? T 
TPP is pyrophosphate. TPP is pyrophosphate. Okay. Okay. Next one. Next one is um, universal electron acceptors. Universal electron acceptors. Okay, now we're gonna talk about electron acceptors. The electron acceptors are nicotinamides, NAD, NADP, which we get from vitamin B3, and flavine nucleotide, which is FAD, which we get from vitamin B2. NAD is used in catabolic processes to carry reducing equivalents such as NADA. Do you guys remember that in the catabolic processes which we talked yesterday, when we see that when we saw that there was a breakdown, there was production of NADH, yes or no? You guys remember this from yesterday? Yeah, for example, in ethanol metabolism, we thought we saw that there was there was more NADH to NAD ratio, right? So that's that. NADPH is used in anabolic processes. For example, fatty acid and steroid synthesis. This is one question. This is one question. Which form is used in catabolic processes? NAD is used in catabolic processes, and NADPH is used in anabolic processes. This is used as a supply of reducing equivalence. Okay, now, what are the types of processes where we use NADPH? The types of processes where we use NADPH are, there are four types. That is anabolic process, respiratory burst, cytochrome P450, and glutathione reductase. You don't have to memorize this right away because you will not receive direct questions from this. Okay, let's keep this in mind that the main pathway is anabolic pathways, and then the next, um, pathways are respiratory burst and cytochrome P450 pathways. And over there we use NADPH, so that's that. Okay, you don't, so once again, you don't have to remember this, this, this you will not be asked about this, but um, the fact that NAD is used for catabolism and NADPH is used for anabolism, that is important and high yield. Are we clear? Yes or no, are we clear about this? Okay. So did we understand the types of the, all the questions we will receive from these three paragraphs? These are very basic and these are very set questions. These questions are set and these are the only questions you will receive. Okay. Is, is everyone clear? Okay, good. Next one. Next one is glucokinase versus hexokinase. Where did we use glucokinase and hexokinase? Where did we use glucokinase and hexokinase? Glycolysis, very good, okay. So glucose can be broken down to glucose 6-phosphate by glucokinase or hexokinase, am I correct? Yes or no? Okay, good. So glucokinase and hexokinase, are they enzymes or not enzymes? Are they enzymes or, or, or not enzymes? What are they? They are enzymes, very good. Okay, so basically glucokinase, phosphorylation of glucose, glucokinase, once again, if they're kinases, then they are doing phosphorylation. Phosphorylation, once again, is the transfer of a high energy, is the transfer of ATP from a high energy molecule to a low energy molecule. The phosphorylation of glucose to yield glucose 6-phosphate is catalyzed by glucokinase in the liver and hexokinase in other tissue, okay? So over here, okay, glucokinase will work in two locations. That is in livers, especially, and the, and the pancreas. And all the other places are hexokinase. All other places are hexokinase. So basically, if glucose is broken down in the liver and pancreas, if you receive a question about this in the step one, that which enzyme is being used, glucokinase or hexokinase, what will be your best answer? Glucokinase or hexokinase. Which enzyme is used to break down the glucose in the liver and the pancreas? What is your best answer? Glucokinase or hexokinase? Glucokinase. And what is the enzyme that is used to break down the glucose in the skeletal muscle? Hexokinase, okay? So is this a question, if you receive this in the step one exam, can you give a proper, con uh, proper confident answer? Yes or no? Okay. After this, 
after this, um, the next one is KM. KM, okay. KM is when we study pharma or pharmacology. Then over there, we will see that KM is, it stands for Michaelis constant. Do you guys know what KM is? Have you guys heard of KM before? What is KM? Can anyone tell me? Can anyone explain what KM is? Right. Okay. Michaelis constant or KM, which we will discuss in details in pharma, is basically it's lower for hexokinase and it's higher for glucokinase, meaning that the affinity to which uh, the enzyme will bind to the substrate the affinity to which the enzyme will bind to the substrate if is that that affinity means the likelihood or um, the or uh, the the um, force at which they will bind basically meaning that they have higher affinity that is if i tell you that how uh, if you for example let me give you an example Let, let's say you have five glucose molecule five glucose molecule. And now if I tell you that uh, in order to bake, break five glucose molecule, uh, how much hexokinase do you need? For example, if I tell you that there are two hexokinase and there are four glucokinase. Okay, since hexokinase have a higher affinity to bind to the glucose, I mean, to the, uh, they have higher affinity to break down the glucose. Can we assume that hexokinase in low amount can still break down glucose more or less at the same rate as four glucokinase? Yes or no? Yes, this is affinity, okay? This is affinity. Are we clear about affinity? That the term is, is everyone on the same board as me? Okay. Okay. Next one. Next one is capacity or Vmax. Vmax is capacity means the rate at which the maximum amount of work that can be done or the volume maximum, the maximum amount of work that can be done by an enzyme, the maximum amount of work that can be done by an enzyme. So what happens with hexokinase is hexokinase, although it can bind and, uh, and in small amount, it can cause a lot of uh, breakdown of glucose. But if I tell you that the capacity of hexokinase is low, then which enzyme can work longer, hexokinase or glucokinase, which one? If I tell you that Vmax of glucokinase is more than hexokinase, then which enzyme can work for a longer period of time? Which enzyme can work for a longer period of time? glucokinase okay glucokinase okay so with that being said let me discuss uh km and vmax once again okay do i have everyone's attention i'm gonna discuss km once again and vmax once again do i have everyone's attention okay km what is km km is represented by half of vmax that is km is basically representing affinity what do we mean by the word affinity Affinity means that small, even for example, if you have five glucose molecules and you have two hexokinase and you have four glucokinase, hexokinase has higher affinity than glucokinase to, to bind to glucose and cause the breakdown. So affinity means that even in small amount, they can cause the same rate of reaction as glucokinase. So, only in the small period of time, they can still break down glucokinase with only two in number, whereas four glucokinase are needed to break down five glucose molecules. So that is basically an, an example. It's, it's, it's the same thing as, let's say, uh, there are two people inside the room, okay? For example, there are two people in, for example, there's a cake, okay? This is a, this is a, this is a, this is a strawberry cake inside the room. You have one person who really loves cake and you have four people 
who does not like cake as much as this guy over here. Okay. So since this guy really loves cake, can he finish the whole cake by himself? Yes or no? Since this guy loves cake, can he finish the whole cake by himself? Yes. But these three, if you ask any one of them to finish the whole cake, can they do it? Can they do it? Yes or no? No. So who has a higher affinity? Who has a higher affinity? A or B? Affinity. Who has a higher affinity? A. So this is affinity. Are we clear about this? Are we clear about this? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, next next question. Now we, we will talk, we will take the same example and then we will talk about VMAX. VMAX is basically this guy, can he eat the cake for a long period of time or can three people eat the cake for a long period of time? Because let's say he will eat it for two hours, he will eat it for two hours, he will eat it for two hours. So, so total is six hours. This guy can only eat for two hours, right? So who has a higher capacity of workload, this group or this group, B or A? B, so B has a higher VMAX. Is everyone clear about this? Okay, is everyone clear about this? Okay, now, now let me talk about this example over here. In the skeletal muscle and where, um, what type of enzyme is used to break down the glucose in skeletal muscle? What type of enzyme is used in the glucose to break down the skeletal muscle? Okay, okay, hexokinase. Now, in the skeletal muscle, do you need sudden burst of, sudden bursts of energy, yes or no? In the skeletal muscle, sudden bursts of energy, right? Because when they have to work, they can get a sudden burst of energy. So if you have hexokinase over here with high affinity, then can hexokinase provide that, that short, decrease time, but high burst of energy, increased burst of energy, right? Okay, now in the liver, is the liver responsible for slow sustained gluconeogenesis or not? Slow sustained gluconeogenesis, okay. So isn't it important that an enzyme such as glucokinase which has, which can increase the time of gluconeogenesis for a long period and slow sustained and can cause slow sustained gluconeogenesis throughout the whole day so that you don't get hypoglycemic. Yes or no? Okay. So this is the difference between glucokinase and hexokinase. Is everyone clear about this? Is everyone clear about this? Okay. Okay, next one. Next one is induction by insulin. Next one is induction by insulin. Glucokinase or hexokinase. Which one will insulin go and work on? Insulin will go and work obviously on the glucokinase because glucokinase is there in the liver, right? So they will go and glucokinase will stimulate the liver to break down the glucose, right? So glucokinase will be induced by liver. Hexokinase will not be in, induced by liver. The feedback mechanism of this one is inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. That is extreme increased glucose 6-phosphate will prevent the action of hexokinase and increased fructose 6-phosphate will prevent the action of glucokinase. Is everyone clear about this? Is everyone clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Okay, repeat once again. Hexokinase is present in all types of tissues except liver and pancreas. Glucokinase is present in liver and pancreas. Hexokinase has more affinity, so less is needed to work. Glucokinase has less affinity, so more is needed to work. Hexokinase can work for a short period of time. That is, they have a low Vmax and glucokinase have a higher capacity, so they can work for a longer period of time. Hexokinase obviously will not be stimulated by insulin because when you need that sudden burst of energy, your hexokinase will get stimulated by itself. Insulin is not responsible. 
But in order to break down the glucose in the liver, insulin has to be there to rest to stimulate the enzyme. So the glucokinase is stimulated by insulin. Next one is feedback mechanism. The feedback is uh, glucose 6-phosphate is the substrate which will produce the negative feedback to hexokinase. That is extreme increased presence of glucose 6-phosphate would prevent further breakdown of glucose and increased amount of fructose 6-phosphate will prevent the further breakdown of glucose by inhibiting the action of glucokinase. Okay, is everyone clear? Okay, good. Okay, so now we will talk about the glycolysis and the regulations. So what's happening over here, glycolysis, is um, over here, glycolysis, is net glucose in cytoplasm, is that the glucose plus two phosphate plus two ADP plus two NAD, it results in the formation of two pyruvate plus two ATP plus two NAD plus two H plus two H2O. Okay, so what's happening over here? This is basically the breakdown of glucose. Okay, this is basically the breakdown of glucose from all the way from over here to over here. Do you guys remember in all the steps how ATP was used and, and NAD was used, right? With all the kinases. This is not important for you to understand, okay? This is not important for you to understand for the USMLE step one in, in the exam, but the most important for you to understand is, is you have to remember in which steps ATP and ADP were used. Do you remember in our yesterday's discussion, we discussed all the steps where ATP was used in all the kinases, yes or no? Do you guys remember the steps where ATP was used to break down the kinases? Guys? Right? So that's that. That's all you have to remember. That's all you have to remember. Okay. So the first step of glycolysis regulation, the first step is glucose is broken down to glucose 6-phosphate by glucokinase or hexokinase. Right now, we're talking about the fact that gluco the regulators, right now, if I ask you the regulators, if I ask you which substrate will prevent glucokinase activity, what's your, uh, so what's your best answer? Which substrate will prevent glucokinase activity? Fructose 6-phosphate. Which substrate will prevent uh, hexokinase activity? Fruit glucose 6-phosphate. So that's that. We, we talked about this before. Okay, next one is fructose 6-phosphate will convert. Fructose 6-phosphate is converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate by phosphofructokinase 1. Do you guys remember the uh, how glucose 6-phosphate was converted to fructose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate was converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate? Do you remember that pathway from the glycolysis? That is this pathway over here, right? Okay, okay. This pathway over here, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, this pathway is the rate-limiting pathway. Does anyone know what the word rate-limiting means? Rate-limiting pathway. Does anyone know what, what that means? Can anyone tell me what rate limiting what rate limiting means? Rate limiting. What does that mean? The key enzyme, exactly. Right. So basically, this step of the uh, this step of the pathway will determine if the reaction will go this way or if the reaction will go this way. Am I clear? Yes or no? Right. Yes. Right. Okay. So fructose 6-phosphate, once it's converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, this reaction has to go this way. And the enzyme that is responsible, so if this step is the rate-limiting step, then can we assume that phosphofructokinase is the rate-limiting enzyme? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay, yes. So this is a question. This is a NBME question. Which enzyme in the glycolytic pathway is a rate limiting enzyme? The, the answer is phosphofructokinase. In order to activate phosphofructokinase, what do you need? You need AMP and fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. Okay. And in order to inactivate or put, put a negative feedback, you need ATP and citrate. If there's increased formation of ATP already, for example, why do we break down glucose? Do we break down glucose for the fact that we need more, more energy? Yes or no? 
do we break down glucose because we need more energy okay but what if we already have a lot of energy do we do we still do, do we still need to break down glucose if we still have a lot of energy so does atp do they represent like energy or not yes or no do they represent energy or not yes so if if we are in a high energy state do we need to break down the glucose by this rate limiting step phosphofructokinase no so atp and citrate where did we see citrate what was the uh, uh, where where did we use citrate yesterday tca cycle do you remember that in tca cycle all the nad fad they are produced they will enter the electron transport chain to produce atp right Right. So if there's more citrate, can we assume there's more activity of the TCA cycle? Fast answers, please. If there's more activity of the TCA cycle, can we assume there's more activity of the electron transport chain? If there's more activity of the electron transport chain, can we assume there's more activity of ATP, more ATP formation? Okay. So will this prevent glycolysis or not? Do we need more energy? No. Okay, good. So this will prevent glycolysis. Are we clear about the regulators, ATP and citrate? Okay. Okay, next one. Next one is, so these are the steps that requires ATP. What are the steps of glycolysis that produces ATP? The steps of glycolysis that produces ATP is when 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is converted to 3-phosphoglycerate by phosphoglycerate kinase, this enzyme is not high yield, not, not very important, so don't worry about this. How, however, this one is high yield, that is pyruvate kinase is more high yield. Okay, pyruvate kinase converts phosphoenoyl pyruvate to pyruvate. Okay, phosphoenoyl pyruvate to pyruvate. That is, this. so this is high yield over here. Okay, now, in order for phosphoenoyl pyruvate to convert to, py to pyruvate, once again, if there's high amount of ATP and, and alanine, will this reaction go in this, in this way? Do we need pyruvate to enter the TCA cycle in the form of acetyl CoA? No. So once again, this is here. But if we have the previous substrate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, can they convert fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to 3-phosphoglycerate and this? And the, the reaction can go this way. So will this be an activator? Yes or no? So can fructose 1,6-bisphosphate be an activator? For example, if we have a lot of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate over here, if there's more over here, will, will this go this way, A, or will this go this way, B? Which way will it go? No, it will go this way because there's already so much fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate does not need to convert to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate anymore. So they will go this way downwards, okay? Go B, no, okay. Which one are you talking about? Which one are you talking about? We're talking about this reaction, phosphoenoyl pyruvate to pyruvate. This reaction, look, look. Look at this reaction, phosphoenoyl pyruvate to pyruvate. We are saying that if you have increased fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, the reaction will go this way. Instead of pyruvate converting to phospho, I mean, in, instead of phosphoenoyl pyruvate converting to, to, to phosphoglycerate, this will go this way, okay? Yes, in gluconeogenesis, they will go B, but we're not talking about gluconeogenesis. We're talking about this pathway, phosphoenoyl pyruvate to pyruvate, okay? Are we clear now? Are we clear now? The alanine part, alanine, where is the alanine? Which alanine are you talking about? Dr. Uday. Oh, this one over here, alanine. Yes, we, we were gonna come to this, alanine. Okay, alanine is basically, okay. Can you start over the produce ATP part? 
Okay, no problem. Alanine, first of all, what is alanine? What is alanine? Amino acid, okay. If we have increased amount of amino acid, can they be broken down to form ATP and like energy? Yes or no, by amino acid metabolism? Because they will enter. So if there's increased amount of amino acid, do we need more energy? Do we need more energy? No. So will this inhibit the phosphoenylpyruvate to, to pyruvate conversion or not? Yes. So that is your explanation for, for alanine. Another one is the only thing you have to understand from, from, from production of ATP is when phosphoenylpyruvate is converted to pyruvate, it is stimulated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Why? Because fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is a previous substrate of phosphoenylpyruvate. So if you have a previous substrate which is increased in concentrations, this will convert very quickly to, to pyruvate. So that's the only reason. That's it. Nothing else. Is everyone clear? Terminology kinase means breakdown, but why in phosphoglycerate it is produced? Which one are you talking about? Oh, this one, the phosphoglycerate kinase, right? Yes or no? Okay. So what's going on over here is 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is converted to 3-phosphoglycerate. So this can go, the, the main um, function of this enzyme is these enzymes are bifunctional, are, I mean, these are bidirectional enzymes. That is, this enzyme can either add a phosphate or remove a phosphate. They are bidirectional. Since they are bidirectional, that's why we did not mention them because they're not very high yield, because they're not contributing to anything. Do you understand? If they were to contribute to the step, then they will need or they will produce energy. Since they do not need energy, nor do they produce energy, that's why these bidirectional enzymes are non-contributory and that is, they're not important. Uh, are we clear? But since they're bidirectional, they can add a, add a sub, I mean, add a compound and remove a compound. Okay. Same for pyruvate kinase. Okay. Mm, pyruvate kinase is not the same because pyruvate kinase is not bidirectional. Pyruvate kinase is, is monodirectional. That is, it, it only works in this way. Okay? So it's not the same. Are we clear now? Pyruvate kinase is not bidirectional. It works in only one, one way, this way. So that's why they are not they, I mean, that's why they are, the term kinase, the term kinase is basically the, the addition of a phosphate group from a high yield ATP to a low yield ATP. So when phosphoenylpyruvate, when a phosphate group is added to this by the enzyme pyruvate kinase, that's, that's when the phosphoenylpyruvate is converted to pyruvate, as simple as that. Okay, there's no reason to uh, think really deeply like into this. The if you could just like focus on the enzymes and um, the regulations, that could uh, be just as enough to be honest. And if you are confused about kinase, that's basically the transfer of a phosphate group from a high energy ATP to a low energy ATP. Okay, is everyone clear about our discussion on this one? Everyone. Are we all on the same page? Are we all on the same page? Okay. Next one. Next one is regulation of fructose, um, reg regulation of fructose 2, 6 bisphosphatase and phosphofructokinase. Okay. These are bifunctional enzymes whose function is reversed by phosphorylation by protein kinase A. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'm confused with fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase, which requires ATP. Okay, just wait for a minute. After we discuss this, I think that this will clear your, your, your confusion. Okay, so right now we're talking about fructose um, 2, 6 bisphosphatase and phosphofructokinase. What is the uh, conversion of which step is, is catalyzed by these two enzymes? Can I get some fast answers, please? 
which substances is converted to which substance by these two enzymes. First, first question is which substance is converted to which substance by fructose bisphosphatase 2? Fructose bisphosphatase. Can I get some fast answers? Fructose bisphosphatase. Anyone? Fructose bisphosphatase. Fructose bisphosphatase converts which step? Fructose 1, 6 bisphosphate to fructose 6 phosphate. Am I correct? Right? Fructose 1, 6 bisphosphate to fructose 6 phosphate. And the enzyme phosphofructokinase converts fructose 6 phosphate to fructose 1, 6 bisphosphate. Am I clear about this step? It just goes in bifunctional, bidirectional. Okay. Is this step the rate limiting step or not? Is this step the rate limiting step? Okay. So can we assume that this is the step which will get regulated when we need more glucose or when we need to break down more glucose? For example, if we need more glucose, this step will work this way. If we do not need more glucose, this step will work this way, right? Yes or no? Okay. What? Okay. Now, insulin. Insulin is uh, is it responsible for forming more glucose or breaking down more glucose? Insulin. Insulin is is it? Insulin is responsible for forming glucose or breaking glucose? Insulin is responsible for forming glucose. Okay, how about glycogen? How about uh, glucagon? Will it form glucose or break glucose? Form glucose. If we talk about insulin, if we talk about it, insulin, which arrow will insulin stimulate, A or B? If insulin has to stimulate A in the rate limiting step, which enzyme would, will insulin stimulate? Phosphofructokinase or fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase? Insulin. Okay. Everyone clear your head. Okay, and I'm gonna ask you another question. Clear your head, just, just clear your head. Don't, don't worry about anything. Glucose to energy. Is this the main step of glycolysis or not? Yes or no? Is this, is this the main step of glycolysis? Okay, you have this reaction working in this way and you have this reaction working in this way. Okay, now, Insulin, is insulin responsible for A or B? A, if insulin is responsible for A, which rate limiting enzyme is working this way? Phosphofructokinase. So if we ask you, which glycolytic enzyme is stimulated by insulin? What is your answer? Your answer is phosphofructokinase. Which enzyme is stimulated by glucagon? Which enzyme is stimulated by glucagon? Fructose 2,6 or 1,6 bisphosphatase. Okay. This is what it is. Now, do you guys remember that when we studied endocrinology and we studied about CAA, MP, we talked about flat champ, FSH, LH, SATH, TCH, yes or no? Do you guys remember flat champ? All the CAMPs? Yes, CHAMP. Over there, do you remember that after flat champ, we had some more enzymes? I mean, we had some more hormones, for example, glucagon, right? Histamine and, and all the other hormones, um, right? Do you remember that glucagon works by increasing cyclic AMP? So glucagon, 
will work by increasing cyclic AMP. When you increase cyclic AMP, you increase protein kinase A. Protein kinase A will activate fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase, right? And decrease the activity of phosphofructokinase. So the ends, so the uh, direction is in this way. It will move in this way. And there will be less glycolysis and more gluconeogenesis. And in the opposite way, if you have insulin, insulin will decrease CAMP and this will decrease protein kinase A and now the reaction will move this way. So this will decrease fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase and increase phosphofructokinase. So there will be more glycolysis and less gluconeogenesis. Is everyone clear about this? Yes or no? Repeat. Okay. Glucagon, will it will this increase gluco, glucose uh, formation or decrease glucose formation? Glucagon, will this increase glucose formation or decrease? Okay, if it increases glucose formation, which enzyme will it act will it activate? Phosphofructokinase or fructose one six bisphosphatase? Fructose one six. Fructose one six bisphosphatase. Am I correct? Yes or no? Fructose one six bisphosphatase. Yes. If it activates fructose, if it activates fructose one six bisphosphatase, then will the right? So what happens is when is glucagon stimulated? Can we assume that glucagon is stimulated when we do not have enough glucose in the body? That that is when you're not when you when for example when you're fasting. Yes or no? Yes. So in fasting, that is when glucagon will activate and it will work in this way. And in a fed state, for example, you just had food. What happens after you eat a high carbohydrate diet? Do you have high insulin or low insulin? Does insulin in in increase or does insulin decrease? Insulin increases, right? Insulin increases. When insulin in increases, which enzyme will be activated? Phosphofructokinase or fructose 2,6 bis bisphosphatase? fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase. So that's exactly what's happening. Fructose 2,6, uh, I mean, phosphofructokinase is increased. Fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase is decreased. And as a result, you have increased breakdown of glucose. Is Now is everyone clear? Yes or no? Now is everyone clear? Okay. Okay, can we move on to pyruvate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase complex? Function of fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase is the breakdown of fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase to fructose 6-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate to the formation of glucose for gluconeogenesis. Are we clear? Okay, can we move on to pyruvate dehydrogenase complex? Okay, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is that these are mitochondrial enzymes which are complex linking glycolysis and TCA cycle. Pyruvate dehydrogenase, what is the action of pyruvate dehydrogenase from yesterday's discussion? Where is pyruvate dehydrogenase used? For which step? Forming acetyl CoA. From which one? Forms acetyl CoA from where? Pyruvate, very good. So it converts pyruvate to acetyl CoA. It converts pyruvate to acetyl CoA over here. Okay. Do you remember we said that in order for uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase to work, you need the action of enzyme B1, 2, then 3, 5. Yes. Yes or no? Yes. And once again, acetyl CoA. Is pyruvate formed in the mitochondria or in the cytoplasm? Pyruvate, is it formed in the mitochondria or in the cytoplasm? It's formed in the cytoplasm, but acetyl-CoA, where is acetyl-CoA formed? Acetyl-CoA production in the mitochondria. So this complex that is pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, can we assume that this is the complex that is responsible for transporting the pyruvate into 
the transformation of pyruvate into the acetyl CoA inside the mitochondria from the cytosol to the mitochondria, yes or no? Okay, okay, good. So what is this activated by? Pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. When you have increased ADP instead of ATP, do you, do you have more energy or less energy? Less energy. If you have less energy, then can this be a stimulator to produce more energy by the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle? Yes. So this is one regulator. Calcium is another, is another regulator because calcium, it helps speed up the process of enzymatic reaction. So that's that. Another one is NAD to NADH ratio. A state of NAD to NADH ratio, does this, this also represents a state of low energy. This also represents a state of low energy. So this will also be a stimulator, but the number one stimulator is increased ADP, okay? So if I talk about uh, the questions, the questions are these ones, that is, you will get multiple questions from over here. Let me put stars, three stars over here. You will get multiple questions from this one where they will ask you which, which vitamins are responsible for the proper functioning of pyruvate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase complex and the vitamins are B1, 2, 3, 5 and lipoic acid, okay? These are the vitamins. If you receive these questions in NBME, are you going to, going to be confident or not confident? Confident or not confident? Fast answers, please. Okay. Now, the com the, the, this complex is similar to alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Do you guys remember alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, which was responsible for converting alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA in the TCA cycle? Yes or no? Do you remember over here, alpha ketoglutarate was converted to succinyl CoA over here by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase over here, right? Okay, so the same, these enzymes are needed for that uh, enzyme complex too, okay? Now, arsenic, For first of all, do you remember that we said that arsenic, when we break down uh, like arsenic, you have no production of ATP, right? Do you remember that in arsenic, we said that when you break down ars glucose in the presence of arsenic, you have no ATP. Why is that happening? Because arsenic inhibits lipoic acid. Arsenic, if it inhibits lipoic acid, will pyruvate be converted to acetyl-CoA? If pyruvate is not converted to acetyl-CoA, will they enter the TCA cycle? If they do not enter the TCA cycle, can they enter the electron transport chain to form ATP? Okay, so that is that. Is everyone clear? Okay. What are the signs symptoms of arsenic poisoning? The signs symptoms of arsenic poisoning, this is very high yield. How do you know a patient has arsenic poisoning? First of all, the clinical features will have pigmentary skin changes, skin cancer. They will have skin changes and skin cancer. Have you ever seen a patient with arsenic poisoning? It's very common in certain countries. No, okay. The patients will have vomiting and diarrhea and they will have a garlic breath. This is very descriptive and this is very diagnostic of arsenic poisoning. The patients will have a garlic breath. They will have pigmentary skin changes, arsenic skin, right? And then they will have vomiting and diarrhea. And along with this, they will also have QT prolongation, QT prolongations. So what are the clinical features of arsenic poisoning? Can we say the clinical features of arsenic poisons are skin changes? Skin, garlic breath, QT prolongation. QT prolongation. And diarrhea, vomiting. Means GI symptoms. GI signs symptoms. Is everyone clear? Is everyone clear about this? Okay. If everyone is clear about this, can we keep the lecture of first aid up to here for today and start fresh from this one on Monday? Okay. 
Okay. Because we already do not have a lot of students. We only have 18 students who are here. Okay, we only have 18 students. And instead of doing the UWorld notes, can we do some questions for today? Yes, okay. Let's do some questions for today. Have we understood glycogen storage disease and lysosomal storage diseases and everything? Yes or no? If glycolysis is active, does that mean phosphofructokinase is always active? Yes. Okay, if glycolysis is happening, the phosphofructokinase is working, okay? Any more question? No, calcium is not very high yield, okay? Because calcium is non-specific. Calcium is non-specific, that's why. It's not very specific. Okay. Can we do the questions? Just give me five minutes. Let me just prepare the questions. You, in the meantime, you guys can take a very short break. Let me prepare the questions. Just give me five minutes. If ATP is very high, then glycolysis is not required. Yes, if ATP is very high, then glycolysis will not happen. Okay? No. No, the answer is no. Okay, glycolysis will not happen. Okay, just give me five minutes.
Okay, is everyone ready to um, solve the questions? Yes or no? Is everyone ready to solve the questions? Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. So can you guys see my screen right now? Okay. Is everyone ready? <clears throat> So the first question that we're going to do today, the first question that we're going to do is from over here. So can we begin? Yes or no? Can we begin? Yes, okay, good. Which of the following types of mutations is most likely occurred in this family? A 45 year old man is diagnosed with cancer of the proximal portion of the colon. His father died of colon cancer. At age 52, he has three siblings. His 55-year-old brother has diagnosed with cancer, but his 57-year-old sister has an endometrial carcinoma. His other sister died of ovarian cancer. Okay, everyone is ready. Everyone is ready. Okay. If you guys are ready, what is your answer, please? Okay. How are you guys so confident? What is your diagnosis? What is your diagnosis? Okay. How did you make that connection? How did you make that connection? How did you understand it's Lynch syndrome and not familial? It's, do you guys see over here, you have the three to one rule? Yes or no? Do you, the three to one rule, right? three generations, two people, one below the age of 50, right? Yes or no? Okay, good. Can we move on to this question? Okay. The patient's condition would be most appropriately characterized as belonging to which of the following general classes of defects? A two-year-old boy is diagnosed with a biochemical defect involving hexose, amino, Days, hexose amount of days, A. Okay, if everyone is ready, what is your, what, if everyone is ready, please say you're ready. Okay, what is your answer? Okay, why, why is it gangliosidosis? and not mucopolysaccharidosis. Why is it gangliosidosis? There we go. GM2, gangliocide, right? GM2, gangliosides, and the condition is Tay-Sachs disease. Are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay. Are these questions easy or not easy? easy. It's easy because you studied them, but these questions are actually the amount of students who got them right. This one was 52%. This one was 38%. Okay, 38%. So you guys are doing absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Next one. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A four-year-old boy is brought to the pediatrician because of gastroenteritis, followed by a brief generalized seizure that left him semi- Comatose. The blood glucose level at admission is 18, and urine is negative for glucose and ketones, but positive for a variety of organic dicarboxylic acids. Intravenous administration of glucose improves his condition within 10 minutes. Following diagnosis of an enzyme deficiency, his parents are cautioned that he uh, to make sure he eats frequently. Okay, is everyone 
ready, please read the answers and tell me if you're ready or not. Are you ready? Everyone else, are you guys ready? Okay. Who thinks the, uh, the answer is A? Who over here thinks the answer is A? Do you, do you guys think the answer is A or not? Everyone thinks the answer is A. Okay. Does anyone have any other better answer? Okay. If the answer is A, what is the diagnosis? Von Gierke's disease. Okay. Von Gierke's disease. But um, in what if I were to tell you that this question is actually the correct answer over here, as a matter of fact, is not von Gierke's disease. The correct answer is C. The correct answer is C. Okay. Okay. If I tell you the correct answer is C, do you think that C is the right answer? Does anyone know what medium chain SR-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency is? Okay. So over here, um, it is not von Gierke's disease because in von Gierke's disease, you have um, hypoglycemia, you have fasting hypoglycemia, but do you realize that in this patient, the urine is negative for ketones? What would happen to the normal ketone level in von Gierke's disease? Will it be high or will it be low? High. If in von Gierke's disease, the ketone is high, then is this one, then can we assume that in this patient, if it was von Gierke's disease, the ketone level would be really high, right? Because his glucose cannot be, right? So as a result, if we exclude von Gierke's disease, then the next uh, sign symptoms, which coincides with this patient, that is hypoglycemia, absence of glucose and ketone bodies, this is um, medium chain SR-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. And the thing is, I want to discuss this question and this enzyme in details when we study MCAD in the future. So right now, can we just assume that this is not von Gierke's disease and this is MCAD and we can discuss this in details when we study medium chain SR-CoA dehydrogenase in details? Because right now, if I talk about this, this will be another long lecture. Yes? Okay. Okay. So this, so this is not your fault that you could not say this one. How about this one? A patient with short stature pre presents with hyperglycemia, hepatomegaly, bleeding, hepatic adenomas, and enlarged kidney. Lab evaluation reveals the presence of increased lactate, cholesterol, triglyceride, and uric acid. This patient has a deficiency of which of the following enzyme? What is your diagnosis? If you're ready, let me know you're ready. Yes, that one is related to fatty acid metabolism. 
if you guys are ready for this question, then let me know you're ready. We'll discuss the previous question tomorrow when we study MCAD. Okay, what is the correct answer? C, what is your diagnosis? Von Gehrig's disease. Okay, do we need any more discussion for this question? Okay, next one. A 50 year old chronic alcoholic presents with dementia, paralysis and difficulty walking. The vitamin deficiency in this patient is required as a cofactor for which of the following enzymes? If, if, if you guys are ready, please tell me you're ready. Okay, what is the correct answer? What is the diagnosis of the patient? Warnicky. Very good. Do we need any more discussion for this one? Okay. A 27 year old medical student is unable to eat lunch and dinner during her clinical rotation. Which of the following enzymes is responsible for helping to maintain blood glucose level by releasing glucose from its storage form in liver? Okay. Anyone? Is anyone ready? Okay. First of all, glucose is stored in liver in which form? Glucose is stored in liver in which form? So which enzyme will break down glycogen over here out of these five? A, B, C, D, or E? C. Okay. So are we clear about this? Are we clear about the last question? Does it need any more further discussion? Okay. So how many questions did you get right out of five? Five biochemistry question, how many did you get right? Five questions, we did five questions. You guys got five out of five, right? And, we did, and one question was not discussed. That, we had six questions today. Out of six questions, one question was not discussed. So we got five out of five right. Okay, how does that feel to get five out of five right in biochemistry? That is a difficult topic without even thinking or taking any time. Does it feel good? Okay, do you guys feel more confident? Okay. Yes, the diseases are more towards the, uh, yes, rate limit, okay. So the fact that you guys can answer uh, these biochemistry questions so fast and uh, in such a good manner, who does the credit go to? Who, who does the credit, who will take the credit for this? No, okay, now that's, that's a wrong answer. Okay, if you tell me that you, that I, that the credit goes to me, then it's the wrong answer. The credit goes to you, okay? The credit goes to every one of you, each and every single one of you, because I can teach you guys for hours and hours and hours, but I cannot make you guys apply the knowledge. Can I make you guys apply the knowledge? I can only teach you, but I can't make you apply it. Who applies the, the knowledge? You apply the knowledge by yourself. You learn something and then you apply the knowledge by yourself. So the step one exam is about application of knowledge, not gaining knowledge, okay? The step one exam is application of the knowledge, not gaining of knowledge. So every credit goes to you. So uh, after we end this week of biochemistry, 
we started the week of biochemistry thinking we were not good at biochemistry. Now we ended the week of biochemistry thinking we're good at biochemistry, yes or no? So when we will be done with our course of the step one lectures of Dr. Hailey step one, when we do a revision, will we be confident when we do the revision or not confident? Confident. We can be confident that yes, when we read it, we read it with absolute perfection and we know exactly what to read and what not to read and we can do a fast revision, okay? Okay. So on this good note, the fact that you guys got five out of five questions right, can we end today's lecture and have a good beginning to our new year with a good note of, of getting five out of five questions right? Okay. Okay, so will I see you guys tomorrow? No, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So the thing is, uh, the extra class for Christmas that we were supposed to take, uh, we were thinking of taking it next week because a lot of the students, they went on a holiday for the first of New Year and we got a lot of emails. They told us that uh, they will not be able to attend the extra class. So is it okay if we take the extra class next week? Because most of the students are on holiday for New Year's. Okay, okay. Dr. Dahlia, what was your question? Dr. Dahlia, what was your question, please? Would you mind repeating your question? My apologies for not seeing your question before. Source of question. Which source of question are you talking about? Oh, it's from Kaplan. Okay. It's from Kaplan and UWorld, offline UWorld. Kaplan. Okay. Are we clear? Does anyone have any more question? Can you upload this book? Unfortunately, no, I cannot upload this book because this book has 500 pages. So it will take us a long time to upload this book. So my apologies. We will not be able to upload the book, but hopefully by the end of our session, we will be done finishing the book. Okay. Okay. No soft copy. No, how about the cover only? Yeah, I can upload the cover to, to help you take the picture and uh, see what, what, what we're doing. Yes, okay, no problem. Okay, any more question, Dr. Karbasi? What was your question? If you want to unmute yourself, yes, you can. Um, I, I have a different question, like it's related to genetics because of the corona vaccination, um, mm -hmm. because we have learned that uh, mRNA, right, can be transcribed to DNA by reverse trans uh, transcript phrase. Yes. Would it be theoretically possible to do that with the vaccine the same way or not? Or Okay, so um, your question is about coronavirus vaccines and your, your question is, you're asking me if you take the mRNA of the virus and can you do the RT-PCR to form the DNA of the vaccine from the mRNA of the virus? Is that what you're asking? Right, because we have this enzyme RNA depending DNA polymerase, which do reverse trans uh, transcriptase. And that's why, yes. Okay, okay, so uh, good question. So first of all, uh, thank you for asking the question. Okay, thank so you. basically coronavirus, coronavirus vaccines, mm -hmm. they are not produced by RT-PCR. Coronavirus is detected by RT-PCR, okay. Having said that, RT-PCR is used only for detection, not for synthesis, only for the detection of uh, RNA viruses, we can do RT-PCR since coronavirus is an RNA virus and we can do RT-PCR to detect RNA virus and that's how we can use RT-PCR by RNA dependent DNA polymerase and presence or absence of uh, DNA from the uh, RNA will help us if the patient has uh, coronavirus for sure 100% or not. The synthesis of vaccines are especially 
what are vaccines? At the end of the day, can we assume that vaccines are nothing but antibodies which goes and attacks the viral antigen and causes phagocytosis and um, this, they destroy the virus in that mechanism? Yes or no? Is that yes. the, yeah, right? So in order for you to create a vaccine, there has to, and also another thing is vaccine, can, can it be considered, if it's an antibody, can we assume that it has a protein-like structure? Yes. Okay. So in order for synthesis of these types of structure, to answer your question, we will not use RT-PCR. We will use another mechanism. We will use another mechanism of, of vaccine synthesis. Uh, for example, we take antigens and then we see if there's formations of antibody. For example, it, when you produce a vaccine, what you do is you take a virus, you kill the virus, but you make sure that the covering of the virus and the antigen of the virus is patent or potent enough to invoke an immune response. When it invo invokes an immune response in a, in a laboratory animal, for example, a mouse, what you do is you take the serum of the mouse, since mouse, they are mammalian species, and we are also mammalian species. So you try to, um, you try to twig different parts of the antibodies that are created from the serum of the mouse, and then you try to uh, make the vaccine. And then once you create the vaccine, the vaccine goes through different phases, phase one, two, three, four. Right? As a matter of fact, we will talk about the phase of the vaccines in our first state anyways, but this is the mechanism of vaccine synthesis. If that's uh, what you were asking, then this is the best possible answer I can give you right now. So is could that... we also do the same with the HIV to do a vaccine? HIV? Yes, would be it's theoretically to... possible. No, it's impossible to create vaccines from HIV because the antigens of HIV, they're constantly changing. Mm -hmm. If the antigen of a virus keeps on changing cons consistently every second, then no antibody will be specific to that antigen, which will be create, which will be, be produced. So for example, you have an HIV virus and you create an antibody for that virus, but the HIV will change its antigen. Mm -hmm. And when it changes it, its, its antigen, the antibody or the vaccine which you have created will not work against that previous antigen. That's why it's impossible to make vaccines uh, from HIV, okay, at least okay. right now. Mm -hmm. Because also the coronavirus has mutations, but they are not so like... like they are there, there, there are mutations, of course, but the mutations are not happening as fast as HIV. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jerry. Thank you. Okay, good question, good discussion on the coronavirus vaccine. Okay, I'm glad you guys are thinking about these things. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any uh, any other question? Yes or no? Okay. If no one else has a question, then can we end today's lecture and um, can we see each other on Monday? I mean, start the lecture on Monday at 9 a.m. Okay. So we will start the lecture at 9 a.m. Thank you so much for doing the lectures with us. Thank you so much for answering the questions of biochemistry perfectly. Thank you so much for putting your attention in our lectures. Okay. Uh, I have a question about previous lecture. Yes, well, what is your question about previous lectures? What is your question about previous lectures? Okay, Dr. Hussein, you have a good weekend too. What is your question about the previous lecture, please? Can I get the previous lecture? Yes, every previous lecture is um, uploaded on the Google Drive in Biochemistry Google Drive, which we have. If you have not gotten the previous lecture, we have sent it out. Please check your mailbox for the Google Drive, which we have sent out. If you do not have or did not receive it, we would be more than happy to send it to you once again, okay? Are we clear about this? best way to study metabolism cycle is taking a picture of the cycle and posting it on the wall and every day looking at the cycle for one or two seconds. Okay. Sir, yes. uh, this is Sabiru. Uh, I'm inquiring about the previous lecture which I didn't attend. And last, oh. last week you, you were saying that, it, like 
what's the problem is that after three months I have exams. So if I can get the previous lecture, which I did attend, I can like read one, one time and then second time I can attend your lecture in the morning time, then it's easier for me to finish it quickly and, you know. I understand. Yeah. What yes. lectures did, did you not attend? From which chapter did you not attend? Like, uh, it, I think you started in October or... Yes, we started in October. Yes, so from the October onwards, uh, I send you an email. Like, if I need to pay something, I'm, I'm ready for that. No problem. But it's a so short... how, about this, how about we read your email and we can get back to you uh, yes, by yes, this weekend? Yes. Okay? I, I send you last, uh, I mean, yesterday. I think day before yesterday, I sent you an email. Okay, so, so to be yes. honest, we don't, I personally don't look through my emails as much as oh. my team members, but I will, I, I, I will try to look into the mail myself and see if there's anything I can uh, do yes, sir. for you during for the whole weekend, weekend. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. During weekend, I'm at home. So like, like if I can listen your upcoming lecture, or the previous lecture, then when you when I, I went through the morning like these classes, at the time it will be revision uh, mm -hmm. twice, mm -hmm. and then like the question can be concentrated more. No like, problem. Okay, so let me get back to you by looking at the email, and I understand exactly what you're trying to say. So yes, let me get back to you by seeing your email, see what we can do for you, and I'll try to get back to you. Let's say by today or tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Sir. Okay. okay. Sir. All right. So, wonderful. Thank you so much for your questions. Anyone else? Does anyone else have any other question? Okay, if no one else has any other question then, um, already students have started leaving. So let me say happy new year to you guys uh, and happy new year to your family. Hope you guys have a great year. And please take this weekend off, make sure to have fun on your weekend, spend time with your family, go outside, do whatever you have to do, stay safe. I'll see you guys on Monday. Make sure you guys do the questions and hopefully next week we will finish biochemistry. Okay, all right, okay. Have a great day, bye-bye now.